Hello, everyone. Can you take your seats? Uh, we're going to be starting uh, right away with, uh, with the uh, speech from Terry Duguid, who's a member of parliament uh, for Winnipeg South and parliamentary secretary uh, to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. And uh, Mr. Duguid, of course, is uh, one of the great uh, proponents and the great lead federally to uh, develop the Canada Water Agency and to better look after uh, fresh water in Canada. I'll say a few words about Mr. Duguid. He, uh, he's an environmental scientist uh, trained at the University of Calgary in his undergraduate and graduate degrees in environmental design, did his field work in the Yukon like all good scientists, and, um, and he, uh, but a, a committed Winnipegger back in Winnipeg now, he has had uh, many key roles in Manitoba before entering federal uh, politics, uh, particularly around sustainability and international development, but even things like the Hudson Bay Railway and, and uh, many other things. So as, uh, as a member of parliament uh, and parliamentary secretary in the last few governments, he's, he's been involved in Western economic diversification and the... Uh, and with uh, responsibility for development of the Canada Water Agency. And he has uh, been a, a fierce, fierce supporter of Global Water Futures federally and the, uh, and the development of the Canada Water Agency. So the, um, with uh, no more uh, time, I think, let's uh, start to bring up Mr. Duguid and uh, connect, and we uh, enjoy to hear the words he has. I understand he's... Uh, He's, uh, Parliament's in session right now, there are votes on, and so it's a uh, tremendous thing that he has made the time uh, to come speak to us today. Well, good afternoon, everyone. John, everybody can hear me all right? Yes, very well. Well, that's, that's great. Uh, well, again, good afternoon. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, I'm delighted to uh, speak to you uh, virtually. Uh, today at the final Global Water Futures uh, Forum. And uh, as John said, uh, I'm currently in Ottawa, which is on the traditional and unceded lands of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg. Uh, but before I begin, uh, I know Minister uh, Gilbo, uh, Stephen Gilbo, our Minister of Environment and Climate Change, uh, asked that I, I share his best wishes and his uh, gratitude for the incredible contribution all of you continue to make towards achieving our shared water goals. And I can tell you, uh, I very much feel the same way. I'd also like to uh, thank John Pomeroy for inviting me to say a few words and, and for being an incredible champion for fresh water uh, here in Canada and around the world. And if, if there's anyone that's more fierce than me on, on fresh water issues, it certainly is one uh, Dr. John uh, Pomeroy. And I'd like to give a, a special thanks to the organizers of today's event. Uh, you have done a terrific job of uh, putting together an exciting program. I know I've seen it. Uh, it, is, uh, it is very detailed. It is very long. And, uh, and uh, I know you're bringing together an exceptional variety of expertise and a wealth of perspectives. As, uh, as all of you know, fresh, clean water is one of humanity's most vital resources. And we are so blessed in this country to be the home for 20% of it. It is essential to the health and well-being of ecosystems, economies, and communities everywhere, and sacred for many Indigenous peoples. I cannot overemphasize the importance of the discussions taking place at this week's forum and the significance of the numerous national discussions that Global Water Futures has successfully convened with its partners since its creation in 2016. Uh, over the years, I've had the privilege of taking part in many of those discussions, and I am the better for it, I can tell you. It's incredible to note that uh, Global Water Futures hosts the largest freshwater research program in the world, right where you are sitting, right now, uh, in the heart of Prairie Canada. Well, uh, seven years have gone by quickly, and I've gotten to know uh, some of the scientists at Environment and Climate Change Canada who have partnered on several of the Global Water Futures projects and supported the University of Saskatchewan science activities with the Global Institute for Water Security. And I've witnessed firsthand the great work uh, the program has done, uh, bringing together diverse perspectives to share science, knowledge, and best practices. 
The accomplishments, uh, respect, and strong relationships gained over these past seven years have been tremendous. These collaborative scientific efforts have strengthened an already significant network of water science and knowledge mo mobilization in Canada. We've seen leading edge water science, transformative technologies, strategies, and technical advances. We've also seen next generation solutions and innovative decision-making tools. And we've seen significant results, capacities, and accomplishments. All of which I'm pleased to know have helped to inform the Government of Canada's work to develop the Canada Water Agency. As you know, it takes everyone, including all governments, uh, Indigenous partners, non-government organizations, and citizens to work together to address freshwater challenges and develop solutions that we can all implement. That's why the Government of Canada is launching a Canada Water Agency that will implement a strengthened freshwater action plan. The Canada Water Agency will work closely with provinces, territories, Indigenous peoples and stakeholders to strengthen collaboration and find the best ways to keep our water safe, clean and well managed. As it evolves, the agency will become a critical data hub, a research platform, a partnership organization and a major funder of freshwater initiatives. Budget 2023 highlighted an $85 million investment over five years uh, to establish an independent departmental agency that reports directly to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change, much like the reporting relationship of the Parks Canada Agency and the Impact Assessment Agency of Canada. This uh, elevated government structure within our system required the full support of our Prime Minister and will be legislated, legislated into existence this fall. Some of you may recall that the Stephen Harper government dissolved the Prairie Farm Rehabilitation Administration, the PFRA, uh, that was in place uh, since the dirty 30s in the prairie, since the 1930s. With the stroke of a pen in 2012, the PFRA and all the good work it was doing in uh, the water management space uh, was gone. To undo the Canada Water Agency, any future government will have to introduce legislation to do so. The Canada Water Agency will be responsible for dispersing the $650 million allocated in Budget 2023 to the Freshwater Action Plan. These funds will support watershed, watershed initiatives in major watersheds from coast to coast to coast. The Canada Water Agency and the Freshwater Action Plan constitute the largest freshwater investment in a generation. And folks, this was done in a very difficult budget year. And let me uh, now give a, a big shout out to John Pomeroy and other water warriors who were relentless, relentless in their advocacy for these critical investments uh, for our most precious resource, fresh water. We owe John and so many of you uh, that are gathered today an enormous debt uh, of gratitude. An immediate goal of the Canada Water Agency will be to advance the modernization of the Canada Water Act to reflect the, to reflect the reality of fresh water in Canada, including climate change and Indigenous rights. The Canada Water Act was introduced in 1971, over 50 years ago, and has essentially remained unchanged, with new challenges to our fresh water it's time, and let me once again say that uh, Global Water Futures, John Pomeroy, so many of you were, were active and, and very persistent in uh, calling for us to modernize the Canada Water Act, and we are doing so, and we'll do so immediately. The Global Water Futures Program has played a significant role in helping us move forward on all of the significant measures that I've mentioned in the last few minutes. And I'm thrilled that the critical research stations and data management uh, systems established through the program, your program, will continue to operate under the Global Water Futures umbrella as Global Water Futures Observatories. Uh, as we uh, move forward with, the, with these initiatives, I am very proud to be able to continue to uh, provide my full support. This week is an opportunity to celebrate your success and I look forward to your continued uh, achievements. I wish you all uh, success at this uh, very, very important uh, forum. 
As John mentioned, uh, unfortunately, I'm involved in, in votes over the next uh, hour. And so uh, I'm going to have to uh, head to the chamber as we as we speak. Um, but uh, I look forward to uh, continuing to connect with all of you as we uh, build a, a very robust uh, freshwater uh, agenda for Canada. And uh, John, once again, thank you uh, for your leadership and for the leadership of uh, Global Water Futures. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Terry. The, uh, uh, Mr. Duguid, the support that uh, you have provided uh, an encouragement to Global Water Futures and the, the vision in developing the Canada Water Agency is, is something we're extremely grateful for, and it provides the, the futures, uh, the good future that we had hoped for with Global Water Futures. Good luck in your uh, voting this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. So. For everyone else, enjoy your luncheon. And then, Chris, when did the session start? 1.30? One, <clears throat> okay, we'll see you at 1.30 for the sessions. Okay, thank you, everyone. I hope everyone had a great lunch. We are gonna begin our third session for our lightning talks. First up, we have Anastasia Snyderhan. Hi, everyone. Um, we aren't actually, there we go, perfect. Um, so I'm just gonna give a quick spiel on a project that I've been working on um, in the Baker Creek watershed, the Northwest Territories. A um, little bit of background. So most studies on permafrost change in the discontinuous permafrost zone have been in lowland plains ecosystems. And we were really interested in looking at some of the land cover change and permafrost change patterns in the Tigus Shield. Um, here there's near surface bedrocks that may offer some greater stability to the landscape in a warming climate. There's also more variable topography across the landscape and that may lead to quite variable, um, quite variable uh, hydrological patterns. And, that could tie into to there being more localized uh, opportunities for permafrost change, um, either aggradation or degradation, but also um, offer some variability on what it may look like differently on a landscape scale from a discontinuous system. So in the Baker Creek watershed, just outside of Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories, we used land cover as a proxy for um, permafrost. So we could assess permafrost change using archival and current imagery. We saw some really interesting land cover change patterns. Um, panel A on this uh, figure shows some extensive uh, tree establishment in the wetland between 1972 and 2017. Um, this is indicative of permafrost degradation. Panel B, we've got an example of permafrost degradation. So the red arrow is pointing out a tree, the Thalsa, um, which is an ice-rich permafrost mound, and it thaws and disappears entirely between the uh, 1972 and 2017 images. So after quantifying these changes and a lot more information that I don't have time to provide you with right now, uh, we actually found that there was net permafrost aggradation in the watershed. Um, I'm not gonna get into the details uh, here, but what we suggest is that the contributing area, the flow into uh, different vegetated features, um, can amplify or ameliorate the effects of periods of anomalous climatic conditions that could make conditions locally favorable for aggradation or degradation of permafrost. Um, so you can come visit me at poster 51 this evening between 4.30 and 6, 6 p.m., I believe, um, and we can talk more about this interplay between hydrology, climate, and permafrost. Thanks. Great talk, Anastasia. Thanks for that. Next up, we have Shubeng Lui. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Zhibang Liu. I'm a postdoc at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, our poster is about uh, snow data simulation for a physically based hydrological model. Snow is a uh, crucial component for the, of the land surface, and it's very important for uh, cold region hydrology and water management. Uh, 
To estimate snow, we have to use a hydrologic model that forced by atmosphere model results, especially for large scale. But uh, it was uh, much uncertainty, uh, for, like uh, error issue and a scaling issue, especially for mountain area. And uh, data simulation can be used to improve the simulation. Um, so our objective is to discover the benefit and challenge of snow data simulation. Our research was conducted in uh, Marmor Creek Research Basin in, in uh, Canadian Rockies. The model was cre was cream. Uh, the hydrogen model was cream, and uh, with a snow pack model as a snowball. Uh, the model was forced by Jam 2.5 kilometers HRDPS, and this simulation method used was a ensemble common filter with 20 ensembles to assimilate in situ measured snow pack properties. This is a figure show the, the, the uh, influence of a, a snow pack property simulation by assimilating different uh, data. And uh, these, this uh, figure on the left shows the benefit of data simulation, which, uh, which you can see the open loop is a, a simulation without data simulation. Uh, the blue line is the forced by jam, contains a large error across the sites. But uh, after this simulation, the, the accuracy is significantly improved. So uh, we have, uh, here's our conclusion. We, we strongly recommend data simulation uh, for snow pack simulation. And uh, we also uh, find some challenge uh, uh, for SWE and snow depth simulation and we provide some uh, solution and a recommendation. Uh, uh, and my poster number is 999. So if you have any comments or questions, please come to chat with me. Thanks. Excellent talk. Thank you so much for that. Next up, we have Luigi Gu. Hello everyone, good afternoon. My name is Li Jie Guo, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Stigantua, and I'm working with my supervisor, Dr. Warren Helgerson. And today I'm happy to share one section of my PhD research, codifying the hydrological effects of agricultural land use and climate change in a cold semi-arid region. We all know in the last several decades, the prairie region has witnessed huge agricultural land use change and climate change as well. But the climate change and agricultural land use change uh, have happened at the same time. So the hydrology change is the combined effects of climate change and land use change. In this work, we develop a framework and use it to separate the combined hydrological effects into climate change and land use change contribution. Specifically speaking, we first extend the virtual basin model and make the virtual basin model can capture the hydrological characteristics of a crop fellow rotation. Then we extend the vertical model and make the extended vertical model can be used to capture the hydrological characteristics of hydrological features in the previous growing season. Finally, we combine the extended vertical framework and the virtual basic model and use the developer framework to separate the hydrological effects of a reduction in the crop fellow rotation and uh, the continuous cropping. Let me give a brief conclusion. So finally, we found the climate change breeds more water resources in the growing season. While replacing the crop fellow rotation with the continuous cropping make less water available for the growing season because the continuous cropping 
uh, have more higher evapotranspiration than a fellow. Thanks for your attention. My post number is 18. If you have some comments and uh, questions, please come to my post. Thank you. That was excellent. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Jorge Garcia Hernandez. The stage is yours. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, hello, everyone. An important aspect to climate-induced water changes is to determine how those variations translate to economical costs to communities in Canada. This economic component is interesting in itself, but assigning a dollar value to water projections help communicate to the general public and policymakers the importance on, on, of investing in water science and the design of mitigation or adaptive strategies and spark the necessary behavioral changes in society. My name is uh, Jorge Garcia, and I will briefly present to you the most re recent iteration of the hydroeconomic modeling tool that has been developed under the supervision of Professor Roy Brower at the University of Waterloo. The purpose of the model is to translate climate-induced water changes to impacts to the Canadian economy. The model is based on the general equilibrium theory where the economy is modeled as a system, where all of its components, households, corporations, nonprofit institutions, government, natural resources, primary factors, and the rest of the world are mutually dependent. This model uh, introduces water both as a com commodity that can be um, bought and sold, and as a primary input factor for production in water-intensive industries. Currently, the model has been applied to study Canada-wide water disruptions to the large water consumers, namely irrigated agriculture, paper manufacturing, mining, power generation, and the water sector. It was also used to test the hypothetical introduction of a water market in Canada as a mechanism to allocate, perhaps more efficiently, water resources to economic activities. I invite those interested to visit poster number 40, where we can discuss more in depth the insights, results, and outcomes of this project. Thank you. Great timing. Okay. And Yi Wang is next. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yi Wang. I'm a PhD candidate from University of Waterloo. My supervisor is Dr. Rich Patron. Um, our research uh, is part of the Mountain Water Future of Global Water Future Program. And then we aim at providing the best estimates of the evaporation of data-limited ecosystems. And then my poster number is 14. So we know that um, it's very hard to model uh, actual evaporation because um, the actual evaporation requires the, um, the, un like the previous knowledge about the soil properties, the soil hydro and the thermal properties. Um, and then those properties can only be, uh, uh, only, only be uh, get by the, uh, the intense lab work and the field measurements. So our uh, research recommends to model the evaporative efficiency instead because the evaporative efficiency is a function of the soil moisture content. And then here um, you can see on the slide that um, the critical soil moisture content is when is the soil moisture content when the SE equals to 0 0.5. And then um, the research showed that um, for the bare soil conditions, this um, critical soil moisture is linearly positive correlated with the soil um, texture parameters. So because this re those research were conducted on the bare soil, so we explore this relationship in the vegetated surfaces, and then we try to figure out if this relationship exists for the, um, the surfaces that are um, covered by the moss and the litter. And then we found out that um, there is this such uh, positive 
uh, linear relationship uh, between the critical soil moisture and the um, the, the ground cover um, weight fluctions, and then we can incorporate this relationship into our modeling approach so that um, we simplified the modeling approach that um, this approach only requires the uh, ground cover weight fractions, the soil moistures, and then saturated soil moisture, and the, the meteorological observations. Um, and then um, the modeling result agrees the measurement really well. So if you want to know more about this approach, uh, you can come to my poster, um, this number 14, and then I'm looking forward to talk to you. Thank you. That was great. Look at these cute little graphics. <laughs> and finally, we have Weijia Xu. I'm, I get to practice my Chinese pronunciation today. <laughs> uh, hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Wei Jia. I'm from Professor Ren's group from University, uh, University of Waterloo. Uh, first, uh, thanks for the Global Water Futures for this opportunity to present our work. Our work is about uh, using a functionalized microwave biosensor to monitor the the E. coli level in water system. E. coli O157 H7 is a common E. coli, is a common e. coli product in Shinga toxin producing, and uh, it is popular in North America. It can cause water contamination, leading to diarrhea and uh, damage human health. Both WHO and the Canada report has official has. Uh, official report has shown that we're still facing the poor water quality situation in some areas. And we also face the threat of the E. coli outbreak. It has also been reported that roughly, it will cost roughly $1 million in lost productivity and health care for each reported E. coli cost. So it requires to construct uh, the monitoring and early warning system for water quality. So we present, uh, uh, for this scenario, we present, uh, we come up with a sensor, a microwave sensor, uh, coated with a functionalized group, group to speci specifically bind with the, the E. coli. This sensor can produce the, can, um, produce the precise and the rapid test for E. coli, and the device is affordable and portable. And, uh, for this project, we not only want to present this sensor, we also want to deliver the, uh, this system which can be used for different applications by changing the functionalized group. And uh, welcome to our poster number 57 for more information. Thank you much. Thank you very much. It's not easy to summarize research in two minutes. So everyone did a really excellent job. Um, if you want to learn more, everyone noted their poster numbers. The poster session tonight is at 4.30, uh, but you can also visit posters at any of the breaks. So please uh, join me in congratulating all of our great speakers this afternoon. Once again, they did an excellent job. Thank you very much. So my name is Alta Foren. Uh, I'm leading this session on changing forested uh, basins. Uh, so just a brief introduction. Uh, in Canada, we have 40% of the area that is covered with the forest, and this is like 400 million hectares of forest. And similar is condition in the US, we are 30% area are about 300 million hectares are covered by the forest. So with the, in Canada, uh, 230 million hectares, or 57% of our forest are one way or the other managed uh, for timber production or any other uh, purpose, and they are very economically significant. With climate change and changing hydrologic cycle, these forests are being transformed we cannot talk about water security until we understand the water balance, water cycle impacts of these forests uh, in Canada. So this is a hugely 
uh, important uh, topic that we have. Uh, for this purpose, uh, GWF project has made tremendous uh, contribution to understand uh, the processes, to develop tools, to uh, generate long-term data sets. Uh, so there, in every single project, there is a some, one way or the other, there's a contribution on the forest ecosystem. So today, we have put a wonderful session and very nice speakers. So these are the speakers, Jennifer Bals, uh, Balster, Aaron uh, Nichols, uh, myself, uh, Rich Petron, Sean Carey, and Logan Fang. Uh, so we look forward to their uh, presentation. So we'll start with uh, Jennifer. So Jennifer uh, Bolster is a professor at uh, Wilfrid Laurier University. She has been focusing on climate change ecosystems in her research area, so welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. Oops, and I'm gonna modify my slides. Okay, let's undo that. Maybe you can tell I'm a Mac user. Ah. Okay, so I was asked to, hello everyone, it's wonderful to be here. Um, and apologies for missing yesterday, my oldest turned 16, so I was celebrating a 16th birthday yesterday. Um, okay, so I was asked to talk about Canada's forests and wildfire. It's a bit of a big topic for a seven minute talk. So I'm gonna focus in on one component of that, that we spent a fair amount of, a fair amount of our efforts through Global Water Futures investigating, which is thinking about the ecological resilience of forests in the face of changing wildfire regimes. Um, this was obviously a really big effort involving a number of Global Water Futures collaborators as well as those outside of Global Water Futures, just to acknowledge them. Um, all right, that worked. All right, so boreal forests are, the, the main disturbance agent in boreal forests is wildfire. It's really essential for the renewal and the, the, the regeneration of these forests. It maintains incredible, you know, spatial heterogeneity and forest structure and composition, and really incredible, incredibly important for maintaining biodiversity in these systems. Um, many species are adapted, very well adapted to this fire regime. We see lots of vegetation, vegetative species that re-sprout from below ground um, very rapidly after fire. If you've wandered around in a fire shortly after the fire has moved through, they're surprisingly green. This happens very fast. This is one incredible adaptation. Another one is serotony, and we see this in the pictures of these black spruce cones. Black spruce have a cone that is sealed shut with resin, and the, the heat from the fire heats that up, melts the resin, and the cone opens, releasing its seeds onto the fresh seed bed. And so in this way, fire helps black maintain black spruce in the landscape. And this is the most widespread and dominant species in, in Canada, in North America's boreal, and it has you know, it has sort of co-evolved co with fire in the boreal. So despite all of these amazing adaptations to fire, we are seeing changes in the fire regime in Canada and around the world. Um, this, is a, this is a graph of changes in burn area uh, over the last several decades in Western Canada, or in Western North America, I should say. Um, but we see these same patterns throughout the circumboreal, circumboreal region. Um, and this corresponds with increases in frequency and severity of wildfires as well. So with climate warming, we're seeing altered fire regime. And we're, you know, the, the questions, the ecological questions are how, how is fire activity impacting various ecological outcomes, including re regeneration of forests. So following the 2014 forests in the Northwest, fires in the Northwest Territories, this was an unprecedented fire year um, where about three and a half million hectares of forested land burned. Um, and we looked, at the, we, we looked at this in the face of these kinds of mega fires. Um, and what you're seeing here, it looks like kind of a complicated figure. One side is for the Taiga Plains, one side is for the Taiga Shield. These are both ecozones. Um, basically on that graph, you'll see three tree species and you see arrows. And the tail of the arrow is what the site was pre-fire, the head of the arrow is what the site was post-fire. And the longer the arrow, the bigger the change from its pre-fire condition. Okay, and so what we see is most of the sites were black spruce dominated. This is no surprise to anyone familiar with the boreal. And also that many of these sites, so about 43% of sites in the plains and 30% on the shield, these transitioned away from black spruce dominance towards something else. On the shield, this tended to be paper birch. 
On the plains, it tended most commonly to be jack pine, um, in some cases aspen. So we're seeing these compositional changes that have functional implications for forests in the north. We looked at drivers of these changes, um, and what we what we see here, the the y-axis is that um, is that axis on the on the coordinate analyses you saw in the previous slide. So the, the y-axis is a transition from black spruce to jack pine, or from black spruce to birch, on the plains and shield respectively. And what we see is that the top panels show residual soil organic layer thickness. Where most of the soil organic layer has been combusted during fire, we see a high likelihood of transitioning away from black spruce toward an alternate endpoint. Likewise, the second set of graphs on here is stand age. The younger the stand, the shorter the fire return interval. So what we see here is that short fire return intervals also drive these compositional changes away from black spruce toward other taxa. So from an outlook perspective, this means that deeper burning, more frequent fires will lead to more frequent state changes in these boreal ecosystems. Then we wanted to scale this up. Um, so to do this, we collected data from, from studies of, of a large number of people from across North America. They needed to have information on post-fire seedling counts and identity. They needed to have information on pre-fire stand structure and composition, and some environmental predictors, uh, uh, environmental variables associated with site conditions, as well as the combustion severity, both the canopy combustion severity and the soil combustion severity. To ask a couple of sort of simple questions, how common are these ecological state changes post-fire across North America? And is the magnitude and direction of change consistent among regions? And so this shows both, this simple kind of stack bar chart shows both conifer resilience and black spruce resilience. So some folks, modeling folks, tend to be more interested in the conifer to deciduous transitions. Ecological folks more interested in kind of how these habitats function will be very interested in the black spruce resilience component. But the way each of these is set up is that the first panel is, um, the first set of bars is all ecozones, and then we go from the Alaskan boreal interior um, eastward toward Quebec and Ontario, which is the shield east. And so in this graph, the orange and red bars are what we consider to be non-resilient outcomes. So these were places where either trees, the, 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 the pre-fire dominant failed to regenerate entirely, um, where there was poor establishment, so it established but not very well, it lost density and dominance, um, where it ended up in a competitive environment. And for black spruce, this means it's going to lose. All of its competitors grow faster than it does, so if it loses dominance and is in a, in a competitive mixture, it's going to get outcompeted and, and you'll have other species growing up above it and forming the, the canopy. The blue bars are the resilient outcome, so these are self-replacement, like we talked about, black spruce replacing itself. Um, and density reduction. So this is where the, you know, black spruce or conifers maintain dominance, but, but reduce in density, so a bit of a stand thinning. So the good news is, for conifers, 73% of stands were resilient, 62% of black spruce stands were resilient, but this conversely means that about 40% of black spruce stands were transitioning away from black spruce. This is a species that has been dominant for six to 10,000 years in this landscape. We looked at drivers of this, and we had a much more complex analysis, but I figured this was a good graph to show. Um, the two most important drivers, both of conifer resilience and black spruce resilience, first was res residual soil organic layer. So how deep did that burn into the soil profile? Where we had very high proportional loss of the soil organic layer, we saw these non-resilient outcomes, the red, brown, and yellow colors. Where the residual soil organic layer was thicker, um, so lower proportional combustion, we saw the more resilient outcomes for both conifers and black spruce. Likewise, the long-term climate moisture deficit was really important. So this is a 30-year climate moisture deficit. Um, parts of the continent that had um, kind of droughtier long-term climate moisture deficit um, tended to see um, a higher frequency of loss of resilience, both for conifers and black spruce. We also looked at the, the post-fire anomalies of climate, and these were not important predictors. So it was really this you know, general drying or the general droughtier versus wetter environment that led to um, the outcomes we were seeing at the, at the continental scale. So when we, when we think about these places where, where we lost resilience in the landscape, where black spruce did not recover, for example, what do those look like? And so if you look at the orange and red and brown bars, we can blow those up and look at what they changed to, in fact. And so the, the trajectory of change panel there shows this. And, and the first thing that jumps out is the yellow bars. Those are places where not only black spruce failed to regenerate, but all trees failed to regenerate. So this is a shift from forested to non-forested, a very important change. And this ranged from 10% to 30% of the sites we measured. So this is a really tremendous um, kind of tremendous negative outcome of, of these recent fires that we're seeing. 
the other tr the other trend that you see in here is that you know, not all places are transitioning to the same thing. In the west, we tend to have more transitions from conifer to deciduous. In the east, it tends to be more dominated by transitions from conifer to jack pine. And so again, the implications of that for forest behavior, for fire behavior, for um, ecosystem functions um, vary across these regions. And so if you like it in a map format, that's more what it looks like. So regionally, it's not a one size fits all would be the take home message. Now, as I mentioned, black spruce has dominated this landscape for about, you know, six to 10,000 years. This is data from the Northwest Territories, um, a pollen profile from, from a lake in the Northwest Territories that shows um, black spruce as being the dominant woody species across this landscape for a very, very long time, about 9,000 years. And, and this has been found across various parts of the boreal. So this has been a, you know, a really critical part of this landscape for a very long time. Um, although I don't have time to show data, we're finding that not only fire is driving declines in black spruce, but permafrost thaw and direct impacts of warming temperatures are driving black spruce to show growth declines and mortality and elevated mortality. So all in all, this suggests that we're seeing with these combined disturbances and combined pressures, seeing a shift away from black spruce toward other um, taxa, which again, from whether you're interested in albedo or carbon fluxes or water fluxes, um, this has implications for the way the system functions. With that, I'll thank you. I probably don't have time for questions. I bet that was more than seven minutes. But thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to chat with anyone after the fact. Our next uh, talk will be from the Aaron Nichols. So the Aaron uh, is a research scientist at Environment and Climate Change Canada. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Altaf. Um, all right. Thank you so much. Um, like, just like Altaf said, my name is Erin Nichols. I just finished my PhD um, at McMaster, and I started back in 2018, back when GWF, GWF was a little bit younger, and so was I. Um, so I'm really grateful to be here and, um, and see the finale of it. Uh, so today, when I was asked to speak about changing forested basins, I immediately thought of what our site looks like, which is shown up here. Um, this is Wolf Creek Research Basin, just south of Whitehorse in Yukon. Um, and you can see that there is forested areas at lower elevations, and then we have the shrub ecosystem. So when we're thinking about how these basins are changing, it's not just the forest, it's also these other um, types of vegetation. And in the Yukon and in other northern areas, we have vegetation ranging with latitude, um, but also with elevation, like I mentioned here. And so um, just want to acknowledge that this work was done on the traditional territory of the Kwanlin Dun, Karkos Tagish, and Tahan Gwich'in um, First Nations. So today I'd just like to quickly summarize some of the, um, the things that we've learned over the course of the last few years, um, particularly involving how these ecosystems change and what that means for evaporative fluxes. So the north is wrapping, warming very rapidly. We're seeing a, um, a number of cascading ecological and hydrological impacts, as you can see here. Vegetation change is one of the most immediate responses to this warming. And so we're seeing this kind of across the north warm, uh, greening. Uh, you can see some greening or some browning here, but mainly we're increasing that amount of biomass um, and increasing NDVI. And so not only are we changing the, the ground surface, um, we're also changing the atmospheric drivers. So this is also a work that came out of GWF um, by Manu Helbig. Um, and you can see that as we're changing air temperature, we're changing the atmospheric demand for moisture, um, or VPD. And then these ecosystems are going to respond differently evaporatively. And so the two main types of vegetation change I'm looking at, um, I know that fire is a massive disturbance, um, but you know, on a sl like slightly slower time scale, we have um, tree line advance with increasing altitude and latitude, um, and this rapid shrubification, as you can see on the left here, um, that's one of the sub-basins in, in Wolf Creek. And so while we're seeing this, this typical greening, um, it's very highly dependent on soil moisture regimes. Um, the sites that I look at, um, one of them in particular is a white spruce stand, and um, it's been known to, across, um, there's been literature out there that says that this is very sensitive to soil moisture regimes, um, and so the different advance of these ecosystems um, depends on a number of these factors. Um, but my research was more about um, a, figuring out how this, these changes in land cover affect evaporative partitioning. So I've used eddy covariance towers, sat flow sensors, and stable water isotopes across three sites in Wolf Creek, which are shown here, um, to represent that vegetative gradient. And so I just want to highlight some of the main um, findings that we've um, 
kind of added to our understanding of these systems. So first of all, we've increased, as we increase um, the amount of vegetation, we decrease the amount of interannual variability in terms of total evaporation. So as we're transitioning these systems to tundra lands, from tundra landscapes potentially to forested ecosystems, we will increase total ET, and we'll also be decreasing that interannual variability. Um, this is important when I mentioned that um, white spruce stands are, are known for potential moisture stress. When we look at the vertical growing season water balance here, we can see that if we're just looking at the May to September precipitation minus evapotranspiration, we can see that we have this large growing season water deficit at the white spruce stand that we don't necessarily see at this, the shrub sites. These are not moisture limited sites. And so even across the same basin, we have very different responses and vertical water balances um, to examine here. And this might suggest that we have reliance on snow water inputs in these systems. And so when we're just looking between the shrubs, we found some interesting dynamics when we're thinking about what happens when shrubs go from kind of sparse landscapes to more dense. We typically see this increase in ET in the mid-growing season, which implies that even if we're, if we're increasing the density of these sites, we may see this little bump during the growing season. And we think that that's likely due to um, increased transpiration from our shrub sites. And we did a bit of work um, partitioning out transpiration from total ET, and we saw quite high contributions um, of shrub transpiration to total ET at these sites. Um, we also used boundary line analysis, which I won't get into, um, but we wanted to establish um, and evaluate the different limits on ET at these sites. So what I want you to just get from this figure um, is, is really looking at the blue bars. The colors represent the most limiting factor of evapotranspiration um, across the year. And the top two panels are our shrub sites and our bottom two are our forested site. And you can see that at our forest sites, especially in 2019, we see this moisture limitation. And so what this means, um, ecologically, we may we see the potential of moisture stress in white spruce, which supports the literature. Um, we also see that the timing of increased air temperature will affect these ecosystems differently. And again, with increasing precipitation, which is projected for Yukon, we may see that that increase in um, precipitation delivery would offset some of this soil moisture stress. But we also think that, that we may see that reliance of snow water at the, sh at the uh, spruce sites, and therefore those decreased snow inputs um, may result in, in moisture stress if we have a lengthened growing season. Um, I won't get into it too much, but we also use these stable water isotopes as fingerprints of water sources among these ecosystems to really ask the question of, do our stable water isotopes support what we're seeing in our mass, um, mass fluxes? So do, we, do they suggest that we are reliant on that snow water at the forest? Um, and so when we think about precipitation delivery into these systems, um, our forest water or our lower elevation site is slightly more enriched and higher up that line. And when we plot our xylem water on top of this, um, we see that this is a slightly the opposite trend. Um, and so we use this seasonal origin index, um, which is basically just a number from you know, negative one to one. If you have a positive value, these, these plants are more reflective of rain. And if you have a negative value, it's more reflective of snow. And what we found is that our forest isotopic composition um, seem to be um, of this more snow origin. So we saw the lowest values at our forest, and we saw at our shrub sites between our two um, covers that we saw um, slightly lower at our site that had larger snow accumulation due to those increase in shrubs. So overall, um, we did see that the white spruce forests are reliant on that winter precipitation. We saw that with our just our eddy data, our sap flux data, and our isotopic data, um, and that that soil moisture deficit may limit species expansion and productivity and cause mortality in these white spruce forests. Um, however, that may be offset by different um, shifting precipitation regimes across this landscape. And when we think about our shrubs, um, our plants seem to be opportunistic and not moisture stressed. They seem to be energy limited and sensitive to that length of the growing season. Um, although we did just compare these two sites, um, the literature out there is a bit confounding on if, we're, if, we, dense, if we increase the density of our shrubs, um, how much that will actually increase ET, whereas if we're um, expanding our shrubs to areas that didn't have shrubs before, that will likely increase ET. So um, we need some future re research in that regard, um, and I also did some work with species-specific responses that I didn't get to, but I'd be happy to discuss that. Um, and so overall, I'm really excited um, to be here today, I'm very grateful that I got to meet everyone in this room and had a great um, experience throughout GWF over the course of the last five years, and I'm really excited to see um, where we go next with the science. So thanks very much. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Next presentation is uh, my presentation. <laughs> so as a chair, so you, you can take liberty to take as much time as you want. So, <laughs> so OK. So, so my name is uh, Alta Foreen. I'm a professor at the School of Geography and Earth Sciences at McMaster University. So before I start, I wanted to thank the GWF for the funding. This was very critical funding for our project, so thank you uh, very much. Uh, so I will be showing basically seven years of progress in short time, like seven or 14 presentations. So we talk, we'll talk about the Southern Forest, uh, Southern Forest Water Futures Project, so that was one component in the south. So, so we have these uh, typical objectives, understanding of eco-hydrological processes, extreme event impacts, and the next, oh, sorry. Yes, sorry, sorry, I forgot. Yes, so I so want to talk about, uh, so we are talking about this area where we have about 23% per, uh, of Canadian population living. Almost one-third of economy is based in this area. So this area is going through a tremendous change because of the land use change, climate change, and other stresses. So how happy the forest basins are in the south is really uh, critical in many different aspects. So I'll be showing uh, some of this work. Uh, so most of the work is at the Turkey Point Observatory. Uh, this is near Lake Erie, so it has uh, five flux stations. Three are age uh, sequences uh, of conifer, uh, one deciduous mature forest, Carolinian forest, and then one agriculture site. So it's a cluster of all major ecosystems in, uh, within a 20 kilometer uh, area. So it's very valuable in that term. Uh, there are, we use primarily eddy covariance, so these are the flux towers, the five flux towers, but we also have the groundwater wells uh, and all uh, major hydrologic uh, measurements, ET, snow, uh, and so both carbon and carbon and uh, all these measurements. So very comprehensive measurements, drone measurements, satellite measurements, so there are many different components, isotopic studies we have done. Uh, so it's a comprehensive uh, project uh, that has been going on since 2023. So we have almost 20 years of data uh, now. Uh, so this shows us uh, the climate variability in this area. Uh, so we have a very unique uh, distribution of precipitation where you get rain after every two and three uh, weeks. Uh, but there is a short uh, term drought and the heat events very frequent you can see in precipitation uh, graph. So there's a lot more interannual variability. These are the shorter extreme episodes that we see in our area because of the unique uh, climate and passing jet streams, conversions over the Great Lakes. Uh, so, but, uh, so that was the climate variability. But in 2021, there was a major insect infestation uh, in the region. This provides us a tremendous opportunity to see how the forest will respond uh, to this major disturbance event. It's most common in the west, but in the uh, east it was not common, so this is a unique opportunity. So we can pinpoint even the date of this uh, thing. Uh, so if you look at the bottom graph, the TPD graph, so that's a deciduous, so you can see this greenish line going down. So it was 350. Uh, grams of carbon source. The site was because of this infestation and it started uh, at the start. So otherwise, typically, it's two tons uh, of carbon uptake that we have over there. But if you look at the graph that is uh, in the upper corner, so whatever happens in a very short six-week or eight-week period in the June and uh, part of the July, that basically decides your carbon uptake for the whole year. So you see this impact in all three different ages of the sites, but more prominent in the uh, upper sites. So this critical period, this period is critical. If you get one big rainfall in that event, so you get uh, four tons of carbon per hectare. If you get less in that rainfall in that particular period, so then you may even be a source, uh, as you can see in the red line. So a very critical 
short growing season impacts that we see here. And these are the papers that have come out. They are listed there based on the study. So this shows us the uh, data over the past 20 years in different ages and different species of the forest. So the progression, you can see the age impacts, you can see a very similar GP in the conifer instance, but things start to break down in the last few years. So last few years, we see consecutive event, concurrent or consecutive events uh, that has a big impact on the forest. If you see the lines, the green line, blue line, and the yellow line, they are different sites, different flux tower sites, different ages. They show the exact same trend. It's a marvelous data that how the different towers in the region are giving you the exact same kind of slope and the trajectory if you have this consecutive heat events. And this is becoming very common as we are going forward. And these are the predictions. So this is very unique information that we are getting out of this. So the paper has been published on this aspect. Uh, this is water use efficiency. The older stands have very similar water use efficiency. It's a start to deviate in the last few years. You can see uh, later on in the graph. So this has an implication on the water balance uh, as well. Uh, this is uh, age versus the carbon uptake. Uh, you can see the different ages, and the red is different species of the forest. So you have this nice trajectory, but look at the circles in the last 10 years. When you have the extreme events, consecutive extreme events, you're getting a lot more variability in carbon uptake in all uh, the sites. Uh, in, so this is a very, very valuable information on the response of the forest water and carbon cycle that we have. Uh, we started this experimental, how we can best manage the forest, what uh, treatment or how harvesting the thinning can be. Uh, effective. So this is a project where we uh, got different data sets in different sources. So we got the information, the very valuable information, top graph from the tree ring, bottom, from, bottom graph from the ET. The 55D, if you have a distributed 55% cover, that's the best management approach you can have for the carbon balance and the water balance. So 55% distributed harvesting can be a way to go forward uh, when we go uh, on this forest. Uh, that's the outcome. So I'm going a little faster. Otherwise, this uh, whole experiment has a lot more remote sensing studies, a lot more studies going on. Uh, we did the synthesis study for whole North American forests, where we look at how these forests respond uh, to extreme events and what may be the uh, implementation. So it was published in Global Change uh, Biology. There, the high productivity forests are more sensitive. The managed forests may be more uh, sensitive. But here, the question comes, how really we want to manage? The 55% 55, uh, 55 distributed forest cover may be best uh, if you want to manage these stands. Then our current work that is going on is the mesh classic simulation uh, at the watershed scale. So we are coupling the classic. We have coupled the classic in the mesh to make uh, the future climate studies and uh, stream levels. So a few slides will be on, on that. So this is a coupled mesh classic outcome. Uh, so you can see at the bottom line, the red line versus the yellow line. The yellow line is when we put the uh, photosynthesis-based uh, uh, carbon model in the mesh. So it pulls down the ET uh, downward. Otherwise, there was an overestimation of the ET. So now we can apply this kind of model going forward for the future climate scenarios, because now we can see the feedback from the vegetation. So it's a, a much a progress that we have done, a very valuable tool that we will have going forward. Uh, we applied this tool in the Hudson Bay area. We looked at the stream flow, how the permafrost degradation is impacting uh, in the Hudson Bay area. So this study was uh, published uh, that reference is uh, given uh, there. And then we also look at how the impact of the large scale atmospheric circulation may be in the southern Ontario. So what is happening that we have these cold uh, fronts coming and they're staying and there's all this news, but we also have the warm fronts coming from the south. So when you have a high pressure warm temperature hovering in the Great Lakes area for a few days, then if that happens in the snowpack area, then it causes the flooding 
uh, risk there. So this happened in 2018. So we study this, how this may be impacted, uh, what kind of impact uh, there can be. So there's a paper that is published on this kind of work uh, that's reference is given. And then we also looked at the future shift in the winter stream flow under the future climate changing if we have this kind of atmospheric circulation changes happening. Uh, so ER50, uh, ECC50 uh, data that we used here. So this study has also uh, been published going forward. What kind of uh, impacts we may see on the stream flow as we go forward. So the most valuable uh, thing that we got from this project is our data. So this is just the paper. It's not the paper. It's the use of the data internationally for very different synthesis study. So the biggest outcome that we get from here is the valuable data that will have a tremendous potential going forward. So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. You. So the next talk uh, will be by, uh, that will be online talk uh, by Rich Patron. So, so Rich, are you uh, there? I think someone will be uh, connecting, yep. Rich. Yep, I'm here, thanks, Altaf. Okay, so the Rich is a professor at uh, Waterloo University. He has been working on the forest ecosystem uh, for quite some time, so we look forward to uh, Rich's talk. Thank you very much. Thanks, Altaf. Um, it's a, a pleasure to be on uh, this panel and, and talk just a tiny bit about some of the, the great work uh, that's been done in GWF over the, um, the past few years. So um, Altaf already talked about the dominance of forest systems in, um, in Canada. And in the West, a lot of this focus has been on their hydrologic role in, in catchment water yield. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the key forest hydrology questions that have been addressed within several of the the, the GWF projects in the West, especially drawing on work from mountain water futures and, and boreal water futures. So some of the, the common threads that um, have underlied a lot of the projects uh, in these, these larger uh, projects was how vegetation structure and stand dynamics influence evapotranspiration and overall forest water use and the sources of that water and the efficiency of different systems in terms of their water use and how these are influenced by climate change, what the resulting response in, in vegetation might be. So I'll just give some examples of some work that's been done uh, in these areas. This is an example from an alpine uh, conifer forest stand in the Kananaskis Valley. So accounting for the most biomass and therefore most water use in alpine uh, watersheds, forest water use is an important consideration. Understanding where these forests get their water and when and how efficiently they, they use it uh, it's going to be very important to the overall watershed water balance and, and water yield. So this plot just shows uh, from this conifer stand, um, transpiration and evapotranspiration over two contrasting seasons. Um, and we can see that there's a significant amount of water that uh, this type of forest stand uses over the course of the day and over the course of, of season. Also shows the importance of snow as a so source of water for these forests more so than growing season rainfall, because we can see um, precipitation in 2017 was much lower, almost half of what it was in 2016, but transpiration was higher um, in 2017. So the difference between those two seasons, there's much higher uh, snow water equivalent and a much slower melt um, in the spring period uh, in that year. So we see already that the snowpack is more important than the growing season climate in terms of precipitation for uh, forest water use. So we've also been looking at the isotopic signature water and tree tissue, sim similar to the work that uh, Aaron presented in her talk, uh, relative to the those of water sources. And it shows that water used by small and large trees over the growing season. This is also work done in the uh, Kananaskis Valley. And the light band across the top is the seasonal range of deuterium values for soil water. Uh, the dark band across the bottom is the seasonal range of deuterium values for groundwater. And that band in the middle is sort of the crossover range in soil water, uh, groundwater values. And we've divided the, the season up into sort of the, the pre-growing season or the pre-green period around snowmelt to the middle or, or peak growing season and then the, the end of the green uh, or growing period. We can see during the, the pre-period, the trees are using or are influenced by groundwater availability. So that's snowmelt uh, water table. 
during the middle growing season period, the trees are primarily using any soil water available during that drier, which is commonly a, a drought period in, in this part of the world. And then the end period, trees are using soil water, but are now influenced by end of season precipitation, usually in, in the form of snow after that, that dry period. And if we compare the, the solid circles to the open circles, we can also see there's a difference in size class water use, especially at the, the end of the growing season where small trees seem to favor soil water, whereas large trees are using more of that infiltrated uh, precipitation. So a lot of this work has implications for tree line movement as well, um, where that movement is into areas of different moisture regimes and how changes in snow patterns might affect forest water use uh, and health. So keep that in mind in terms of some questions we still have to dig a little deeper to into uh, as we move forward. Similar example of, of some work done in the boreal. This is from a deciduous aspen dominated uh, boreal stand. Uh, in this case, we can see that the trees aren't going deep to the water table. This is a dry part of the boreal forest and the boreal plain where water tables are typically seven to 10 meters below the surface. And these forest stands aren't going deep to get that water they're going to the adjacent wetland areas and through the process of hydraulic redistribution, bringing that water back up um, into the, the forest stands. So in these projects, there's been a fair bit of work on tree line uh, migration as well. Um, looking at how as precip precipitation regimes change, um, how it will influence the elevational gradients and moisture availability. And as the temperature regime changes, how it will expand the range of suitable climatic conditions. So both of these should expand the range of existing vegetation communities, which will generally expand upward um, elevation. This is an example of some work uh, from Wolf Creek and Yukon that shows significant shrubification and tree expansion over only uh, 12 years. Um, so thing we have to keep in mind here too with this expansion, this is also going to change overall water use in these alpine watersheds and therefore water yield um, to downstream uses. Similar work uh, has also been done using alpine tree islands as kind of a, a surrogate for, for tree line expansion, looking at whether the, as these clusters of trees develop above tree line, are they evapotranspiration windows or recharge areas? So just a couple of plots here to, to show you. Uh, on the left, we have evapotranspiration and comparing uh, evapotranspiration between open areas, the, the more bluey colored uh, box plot and the tree island or the, the tree clusters on the left, um, and we can see that tree islands and clusters seem to evapotranspire less than the surrounding open areas. And this is likely due to the broad leaf ground cover layer, uh, as well as just the increased turbulent exposure of the open areas. And on the right, we're looking at uh, snow accumulation between the open areas and the uh, tree islands as well. And we can see that the tree islands or clusters tend to accumulate more snow than the surrounding open areas as well. So at least it, it looks like the tree islands appear to have a net recharge function in these transition areas, which means that uh, we need to do more work though to understand uh, the feedbacks associated with these processes um, in these areas. So we understand the role of vegetation and vegetation change on water, energy, and carbon cycling, and we know that that's critical. Um, and as such, many aspects of global water futures have been examining coupled eco-hydrological interactions in these systems. But we need a further understanding of tree physiology and interactions with timing and utilization of specific water sources during some of the pivotal uh, points of the growing season, such as spring snowmelt, especially as well as how these systems might respond to changing precipitation timing, phase and magnitude or growing season length and vegetation, snow um, and rain interactions. We've also seen how important spatial patterns of snow uh, redistribution, especially around tree line are and interactions with moisture storage to control um, sublimation and evapotranspiration. But there's still a lot to be learned here, especially as precipitation climatologies change. And finally, we also need to better understand transpiration processes in the shoulder seasons. I mentioned already the spring period, but um, when moisture is most abundant and all hydrological processes are active, as well as what's the, the importance of sublimation um, in the non-growing season. So just a quick recap of some of the work. Hopefully I brought us back uh, somewhere close to being on schedule. But again, uh, thanks for uh, letting me share this info with you. Thanks, Altaf. Thank you very much. So our, ne 
Our next talk uh, would be by Professor Sean Carey from the McMaster University, my colleague. Thank you. Okay. All right, that helps. All right. Well, thanks, Altaf, and thanks, everyone, for the opportunity to, I guess, give something of a confession. Usually, I don't try to talk about this sort of work in a such esteemed colleagues, they usually talk about it at, uh, with others, but uh, I'm gonna talk to you about some work we did in Boreal Water Futures Phase One, and, and like all proper boreal forests, as Jen said, Boreal Water Futures One burned to the ground and became something completely different in Boreal Water Phase Two, and uh, so, but this was a Boreal Water Phase One project, which was quite closely tied with um, some industrial objectives about how we restore and reclaim some of our landscapes. Um, it didn't always start this way. I put this up just after I heard Terry Duguid give a talk and talked about John Palmer as a water warrior. This is John Palmer's official water warrior photo on the right. And I wanted to thank John personally just for all his leadership. Uh, most people probably don't recognize John in that photo. I recognize John in that photo. And uh, I caught him here on the left with his pants down, which is rarely done with a scientist of this stature. Um, but this was uh, how it started, working in cold environments in the Yukon. But I, um, I went to the University of Saskatchewan in 2000 as a brand new professor right out of the box. And I started, this was before Professor Pomeroy had arrived there, and I started mingling with some engineers and geoscientists, and they started getting me interested in kind of issues more kind of cognizant to Western Canada and the trades and mining and, and, and forestry, et cetera, et cetera. And I think this sort of famous sort of political economist, Harold Linnis, makes sometimes what we do in Canada hydrologically a bit peculiar and different just because we do have a lot of resource extraction. And so uh, a good friend of mine, uh, U of S professor Lee Barber, he uh, said, Sean, have you ever been to a mine before? And I'm like, nope. And he's like, it's time to go to a mine. So we went up to Key Lake, Saskatchewan, and he said, you think you can grow trees on this mine? And that's me in 2001, and those are my trees. So I lost my job. So in 2004, I left the University of Saskatchewan and moved to Ottawa, but I always re re reminded myself about how of the devastating impact of, of mining on um, the Canadian environment, and this is just recently. There's lots of active mining, but across, we saw the contaminated sites issue that Jeff McKenzie said this morning. There's billions and trillions of dollars of liability that we all hold from abandoned mines and contaminated sites across Canada. We also continue to mine and extract from large areas of Canada, particularly Western Canada. I put these two little videos together. Um, the left is the Syncrude Base Mine site. Uh, the right is actually the oil sands region. I don't know if Al Petronero is here, but him and Tris Stadnick were giving a talk at the CGU about uh, the impact of these regionally on hydrological response. And you can see they're transitioning landscapes. Landscapes are becoming from a mix of classic boreal forests with, with wetlands and forests and uplands and lowlands into pit lakes, it looks like a zipper opening up, more lakes, et cetera, et cetera. And so industry has, has, for the last 20 years, been working with some of us to say, well, we do on the bottom, but we want the top. But it looked like the top before the bottom. And, uh, and no one really knew how to do this. And uh, so it's something that it's not reclamation, it's reconstruction and restoration. So we've been using uh, long-term experiments uh, over the last 20-ish years, uh, and particularly in the last several years since Boreal Water Futures and Global Water Futures, to sort of understand how we can reclaim landscapes. What are the best practices? How do we go about salvaging ecosystems? What do we store? What do we not store? What are the hits? What are the misses? And I've been doing this since, yeah, 2000. Two, I was in Fort McMurray, uh, sort of setting up sites and, and having the joys and the, and the pains of watching ecosystems turn from these big dirt piles into sort of grass piles, into barley piles, into aspens, and into bigger forests, and we always have to get the tower higher, and then we have to get the tower higher, then we have to get the tower higher, and it costs more money, and we keep watching these ecosystems, and really, we don't have much of a scientific experiment other than we're just gonna keep watching what's going on. And we're doing this across all sorts of different forests, all sorts of different uplands, I'll talk about other things, but to try to look at pine, spruce, thicker soils, thinner soils, organic soils, fine, coarse texture, salty, unsalty, to try to piece together what are the best reclamation practices because we don't really know. And so in Boreal Water Futures, I had a postdoc, uh, Graham Clark, who worked with Rich Patron, who's been doing a lot of this work as well for a long time, to put together all the, the data we had in a, some sort of a meta-analysis. So we had 56 years of site data, and we just wanted to say, are these forests franken forests? Are they anything like natural forests? What's a hit? What's a miss? 
what do we go back to these industries uh, who are still doing this work and tell them what they should do and what they shouldn't do? So Graham trolled together all the data that we had and uh, also other, the Berms Boreas sites, I thought Alan Barr was here, to basically put our stuff in context and look at broadleaf and, and harvested sites and oil sand sites and see where the similarities were, where sites were performing better, where sites were performing worst. It's a very straightforward type of analysis, and it showed that you know sometimes reclamation, when they threw a lot of soils at it, they would actually probably recover a bit slower, but eventually achieve uh, rates of success similar to um, reference sites based on sort of their water use, their, their total. If we looked after 10 years, and if you look on the top, the left is the broadleaf, the right's the conifers, well, it looks like the broadleafs, the, the green is the, oil sands, the red is the berm sites, the yellow is the harvested sites, they're all kind of the same. I don't know stats, it looks close to me. Um, and on the conifers, it looks like our conifers actually are using more water and outperforming things like the old jack pine um, sites at Boreas berms. And we largely think this is because of the ability of them to actually place more soils and richer soils down uh, to sustain conifer ecosystems which actually are healthier, quote unquote, um, than, than kind of reference systems which are often more nutrient limited. Um, so we've spent this, we published it just recently and so it's kind of neat and, and companies are quite excited about some of this work. But when we kind of reclaim forests and it's a forest watershed session, we have to realize that forests um, exist in other landscapes. Uh, they don't exist by themselves and forests in sort of the boreal are to provide water to wetlands and provide water to pit lakes or lakes or receiving bodies of water and eventually into the Athabasca where no water has been released. And uh, this is a big thing. I could come up here for a few hours, cry a little bit and tell you all the hits and misses. It's not just water, it's salts, it's ecological aspects. So this is something that we as Canadians should take great concern about and sort of continue to encourage industry to support the research into doing best practices because Boreal Water Futures One did some really strong work on this and partnered with, uh, with industry in that. Um, it's not just there, it's across Canada. Those had abandoned mines. Um, in the Yukon, the Farrell mine was once Canada's largest, actually it was once the largest mine in the world. In typical Canadian mining fashion, they declared bankruptcy and walked away, leaving the liability with you. So far, we've spent about a billion dollars at the Farrell mine site knowing pretty much nothing about how to fix it. But uh, they've decided to throw another $500 million at it. And Global Water Futures has had a, sort of a strong impact in working with the new operators of the mine to set up systems to sort of see, are these sites reclaimable? How do we reclaim them? What do we do? And because we have Wolf Creek Research Basin, which is a global water futures observatory future basin, we're able to leverage these cold climates and cold sites to sort of see, are these sites performing in a way? So we're using the, our research observatories, and this is a, a figure that Aaron made long ago, or maybe not too long ago, looking at how sites resist evaporation and sort of putting sort of these reclamation sites in context with the natural ecosystems Aaron looked at with her PhD. So Global Water Futures and Boreal Water Futures has made, and Mountain Water Futures, has made quite a strong contribution to applied industrial aspects of forest reclamation that I think they should be proud of. Sometimes it makes you feel a little uncomfortable when you show these sides because science isn't always pretty, particularly mine sites, but I think uh, some of the science we've done is pretty important and has broader uh, applied applications in many different ways. So I think that's all I've got. So I'm getting hard times to get the escape. So the next talk uh, would be Logan Fang on the hydrologic modeling. So this will be our last talk. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Logan Fang, and I work for uh, uh, Center for Hydrology as a research uh, scientist um, with all the my co-panelists on the stage, I don't need to emphasize the uh, importance of a forest. But uh, as a hydrologist, uh, I want to know the role of the forest in the hydrological cycle, and more specifically, as a modeler, I want to know how to uh, represent the forest in the hydrological modeling, because it has, um, yeah, so this is a process, hydrological process, dominant hydrological process in the forest environment. Uh, forest, um, based um, depending on the types and density, it has a tremendous impact on the uh, um, subcanopy uh, snow accumulation because it uh, has a capacity to intercept snow, and then the intercepted snow has a potential to be sublimated loss to the atmosphere, 
And also, um, you can also have uh, unloading to the sub, sub canopy. So the snowpack under canopy uh, would uh, have a difference compared to the uh, down forest site. And then this has a timing difference of a snow melt and a streamflow generation. In addition, uh, forest can also play a role in the rainfall interception. And the rainfall interception can also be lost to the atmosphere by the evaporation. And then the, uh, the for, so amount of a rainfall reach to the uh, sub canopy can also um, impact the amount of a moisture in the soil. And the mo uh, amount of moisture would have a influence on the evap evapotranspiration from the soil. Um, so all the, all the process would uh, ultimately affect the uh, stream flow generation to the uh, river and so on, lakes. So two sites uh, of my talks is uh, long-term legacy sites. One is uh, Marmon Creek Research Basin, uh, established in 1960s as the uh, Eastern Slope Watershed Program. It, it, it's located in the Alberta, uh, Eastern Slope of Canadian Rocky. And it's a small watershed, uh, about 10 square kilometer, but it has a very uh, heterogeneity from uh, mountain forest, subalpine forest, and uh, treeline forest, um, to the alpine. And then also it has uh, done many uh, experiments from the forest clearing experiments to study the impact on the snow melt rates and also stream flow generation. The other site of, uh, is located in the southern boreal forest in uh, Saskatchewan. Uh, it's uh, established in early 90s from this um, Boras, but later on become a Burns experiment site. Um, it, it's about 600 square kilometer, but um, predominantly um, by, um, occupied by the uh, conifer forest, uh, black spruce, old black spruce, um, old jack pine, and um, it, part of the basin was also harvest the jack pine forest. Uh, and then there's a small portion of the uh, uh, basin is occupied by the aspen forest. And additional land cover is uh, it's a wetland firm. So uh, the model uh, I used is a code region hydrological modeling platform. In the uh, model, I set up the um, snow melt um, to, to examine the difference between the forest and then the uh, clearing nearby the forest. As you can see, the, uh, without forest cover, uh, the snow accumulation would be much higher and with forest. On the left, and the left is from the Marmon Creek, Engelman Spruce Forest. So it's, it's much higher for the uh, clearing site compared to the forest cover because the forest intercepts the snow and the snow sublimate. So the difference is about 56% of a peak, annual, annual peak. Sway, that's, it, um, that's because of the uh, sublimation loss uh, from the interception. Um, on, the, on the right is from the boreal forest, um, it's old, um, old black spruce forest. Similarly, uh, much higher um, uh, peak, uh, peak snow accumulation compared to the uh, black spruce forest. 31% uh, uh, is lost to uh, sublimation from the interception process. Um, additionally, um, as you can see the forest, um, you can also reduce the energy uh, from the radiation, incoming solar radiation, and also re uh, suppressing the wind, the, the wind flow would be, uh, wind speed would be much lower, so part of the turbulence flux would be suppressed, so it's, the snowpack would uh, melt early despite uh, lower peak snow accumulation. So the snow would last longer. This would uh, have a much, um, so there's a timing influence on the stream flow generation from the forest basin. Um, so this slide showed the, uh, some of the modeling I did, we did uh, on the uh, cold region hydrological modeling platform for, to examine uh, different types of forest disturbance. Uh, from the pine beetle uh, infestation and uh, forest clear cut at, on a different aspect, uh, as well as uh, forest fire. Um, 
for Marmon Creek, uh, on, the, on the left uh, panel, uh, the figure is showing the uh, basin snow melt volume uh, change uh, to a different, uh, to a different uh, forest disturbance. As you can see, the pine beetle uh, uh, scenario has lowest uh, impact uh, on the basin snow melt volume. And it's because um, Marmon Creek has um, only lower part of uh, Marmon Creek has a uh, pine forest, uh, which, which only introduced about 10% uh, change to the increase to the snow melt when the, when the pine forest is in, um, infested by the pine beetle. Uh, additionally, the, for the forest, uh, forest uh, cut, uh, different aspect north facing and south facing, they have a moderate uh, increase uh, to, to the basin snow melt uh, uh, volume increase. The biggest uh, one, uh, the biggest increase to the snow melt uh, volume is from uh, uh, harvesting without, um, uh, sorry, for the fire, but with the salvaging logging, so it means uh, there's no more forest. So there's about 60% um, of the forest uh, uh, would uh, affect in that scenario, and then it's about 50% of uh, increase of uh, basin snow melt volume. Uh, the figure on the right uh, is showing the response of a basin stream flow. As you can see, it's not as uh, high as snow melt. Uh, the reason for that is um, um, for uh, Marmon Creek is, um, has a lot of uh, different types of um, forest and also has a slope and uh, aspect. And as well as uh, there's a large part of a basin is uh, alpine. So all, 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 in all, all those process would uh, have uh, some offset effect one in one another. That's, um, so it's not direct translate to the basin stream flow response. Um, for, the, uh, for the basin uh, with fire and, and salvaging logging, the, the highest uh, increase to the basin stream flow is uh, less than 9%. Um, yeah. Um, next, I, uh, I also sh um, examine the uh, uh, future of um, snowpack simulation for the future pseudo global warming. This is utilizing the wolf um, uh, model outputs. Um, so the line here, the blue line showing the control period, which is from 2005 uh, to 2013. It's a mean annual, a mean annual snow accumulation for those eight years. The blue shading is showing the interannual variability of those eight years. And then the red is showing the corresponding end of century pseudo -gloaming, uh, global warming uh, uh, weather. Uh, so the eight years, as you can see, the, the, the red is showing the eight years of mean in the future, and the red uh, shading is showing the interannual variability. As you can see, the, in the future, all those eco zones from the alpine to the tree line eco zone and the mountain, uh, mountain, uh, mountain forest and the sub alpine forest, they all have this uh, collapsing of a snowpack and also shorter, much, much shorter snow accumulation. The, the figure, the panel figure in the right, uh, bottom right showing the basin average. In, um, on average, there will be 40, per, uh, 40 millimeter uh, lower peak sway and 49 days of uh, shorter uh, snow cover. And then that 40, 80, 84 millimeter of uh, uh, less snow melt volume. Uh, this slide showing the uh, basin stream flow response to the similar to the same pseudo global warming scenario. Um, there, for the, for that condition of uh, uh, 4.7 degrees warmer and 60 percent of more pressure, uh, there's a 18 percent of increase. But the uh, the stream flow is uh, shifting much early time. The stream flow uh, springs uh, fresh is sh shifting much early time. 40, about 45 uh, days earlier. Uh, the reason I think is because uh, there's a um, re reduce of a snow snow um, melt, a snow snow accumulation and rainfall. So the the peak is shifting. Uh, the peak is lower. 
despite the higher uh, stream flow generation, that's because there is more precept. Um, this slide showing the um, sensitivity analysis of uh, uh, perturbation of the climate and also the forest harvesting uh, in uh, uh, White Gull Creek. Uh, the line on the top, in the low cut means there's a healthy forest, uh, the intact uh, forest. There's no anything, there's no change uh, to, to the cut and uh, to the forest in uh, White Gull. And the one HJP is the harvest jack pine. That means the cut, uh, all the jack pine, uh, harvest jack pine forest. And OJP is the cut, the cut means the cut all the old jack pine forest. And aspen, Aspen ASP cut means uh, cut all the aspen forest. And then the um, OBS means uh, um, cut means uh, um, cut all the old black spruce forest. So the, the, the message here is showing the, when we have uh, more precept uh, increase from, uh, increase 10% all the way to uh, 30%, there's an increase of uh, stream flow uh, for the basin, when we decrease that um, um, precept from 10% to 30%, there will be a, a decrease of a, um, a basin stream flow. And, but uh, but the, uh, when the temperature increase from zero to uh, uh, six degrees, uh, it's, the response is uh, much smaller than increase of uh, precept or changing the precept. And the, the, the figure on the bottom showing the timing, which is 50% of uh, stream flow volume, is showing the, um, uh, when precept is increased, the timing would uh, delay, the, which makes sense. There's more stream flow, and when the precept uh, decrease, uh, timing of the 50% of uh, annual stream flow volume would uh, shift early. And for the increased temperature, the, the timing would shift uh, early. Another thing is um, uh, the, when combining the, per, per, per type, per type, uh, the warming uh, temperature and also increase uh, uh, precept to the harvest, the biggest uh, change is, is to the old black spruce uh, cutting. That's because uh, the White Gulf Creek is almost 40% um, of uh, uh, old, jack, uh, old jack pine, uh, sorry, old black spruce forest cover. Uh, that's all my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. I can take justification for a little bit over time because we started a little late, so we, you guys can excuse us. So, uh, but I think, uh, I know you, we are in the coffee time, but there's a one chance for one question if someone wants to ask to the panel. So, one more minute. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, just be loud. Just be loud. Yes. <laughs> uh, Jen, the soils, after they burn, like, do they recover ever from if it's a really hot fire? Uh, could you comment on that? Okay, I, I, oh, okay, I'll do that. I was just going to talk loud, too, because I can do that. Um, Yes, yeah, so they, they absolutely do recover. Um, so we've, we've done some work looking at kind of uh, space for time. Uh, so we use fr uh, chrono sequences of time after fire. And we see, you know, interestingly, it's sort of the slowest recovery of soils in the wettest parts of the landscape. So the parts of the landscape that are more resilient from kind of a forest perspective, so say black spruce do better there, they're less resilient from a carbon recovery perspective, so they lose a fair amount of carbon, and it takes a very long time. It takes a very long time for the, the carbon to recover in those stands, whereas m more mesic or upland sites tend to recover their pre-fire organic layer thickness much more rapidly and recover that, that lost carbon. So it really depends on where you are in the landscape, and so it, you know, although those wetter parts of the landscape are very resistant to burning because of the high moisture and all of that sort of thing, they tend to be, from a soil carbon perspective, less resilient in their, you know, recovery of pre-fire organic content. So, yeah. 
Thank you very much for your patience. Uh, so would you feel free to ask uh, questions to the panel. So thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. As people are um, coming back after the break, uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Changing Lakes, Ponds, and Wetlands session uh, with two co-conveners, Philippe Van Kappelen and myself. Um, Philippe's virtual today, so we will start off uh, with a talk from Philippe, um, followed by Phil, Helen, and Chris, followed by me. Um, Overall, we are covering um, a few Global Water Futures projects, uh, the Lake Futures, um, urban water systems, uh, prairie drainage, prairie water, and farm blooms, uh, thinking about uh, the changing phase of lakes, ponds, and wetlands, and the progress that has been made in these projects over the last few years. Could someone help me with the Zoom and how to, because the next talk is Philippe's. Okay, there he is. Can you see my screen now? Yep. Yes. Okay. So uh, greetings, everyone. Greetings from um, from Kitchener Waterloo. Uh, I could unfortunately not make it uh, to be with you today. So I'll be talking about eutrophication and eutrophication mostly talking about lakes uh, as one of the major problems that are facing freshwater, but also near shore marine environments uh, in Canada and across the world. Uh, the most extreme manifestation of eutrophication are nuisance uh, and harmful algal blooms that in turn may have many negative ecological and economic consequences. Now, nutrient enrichment is the major driver of eutrophication. And among the different nutrients, phosphorus is usually considered to be the leading culprit. And this goes back to research in the late 1960s at the experimental lakes facilities in uh, Western Ontario, where whole lake fertilization experiments conclusively showed that additions of phosphorus result in algal blooms. And so since then, the paradigm in lake eutrophication management is that reducing external phosphorus inputs is the key to mitigate cultural eutrophication of lakes, ponds, and other aquatic environments. Now, in addition to the external input of phosphorus from a lake's watershed, there is also the process of internal phosphorus loading. That's the recycling of phosphorus inside the lake, which is illustrated here on the left. So external phosphorus is entering the lake, which is used by algae and other aquatic plants. And then the resulting organic debris settles to the bottom of the lake where various degradation processes regenerate dissolved phosphorus, which can then be released back into the lake's water column. Now, if you're an algal cell, it really doesn't matter whether the phosphorus you need is coming from outside the lake or whether it's recycled in the lake itself. Now, as you can imagine, the more intense the in-lake recycling, the more important the, the phosphorus loading, the more algae can grow. And so here on the right, is data from a cold temperate lake in Norway, where integrated an entire year, the external and internal phosphorus loads are of the same magnitude. And as the great bars show, during the summer months, internal phosphorus loading is actually the major source of phosphorus supporting algal growth. Now, a first important finding of our GWF funded research, here listed as outcome 1.1, is that excess external phosphorus supply to a lake typically ends up accumulating in the bottom sediments under geochemically reactive forms. That is, forms of phosphorus that would be expected to decompose over time. And then this leads to the next major research outcome, namely that the reactive phosphorus legacies that have accumulated in a lake's sediments over time can fuel internal phosphorus loading on timescales of decades to centuries. Now, this is illustrated by the graphs on the right uh, for model simulations for the Norwegian lake I just mentioned in the previous slide. And so these are model predicted concentrations of dissolved inorganic phosphorus in the lake, in the top panel, and the internal phosphorus loading in the bottom panel. And this is for a scenario where all external phosphorus loading from the watershed would stop in the year 2015. And what we see is this very slow decay of the internal phosphorus loading with a half-life, in this case, in excess of 200 years. Now, from a management point of view, this means that such long-term internal phosphorus loading from the reactive sediment phosphorus legacies can delay the full recovery of eutrophication even after the external fossil supply has been greatly uh, reduced. Now, of course, we're also living in an era of global climate change, and since eutrophication is at heart an ecological phenomenon, we also need to consider the role of climate conditions. And so one major outcome of an analysis of time series data from over 300 lakes from cold temperate and cold regions 
is that ice phenology plays a very important role. In particular, we found that ice cover extent and duration of the preceding winter season has a major impact on the spring algal bloom, but not much on the algal growth dynamics later in the year. And so one consequence is that the general decrease in ice cover because of climate warming is causing earlier spring blooms and an associated lengthening of the growth season, potentially increasing the productivity of the lake. Now, another important finding is that climate change may activate internal phosphorus loading pathways other than the classical release of dissolved phosphorus from bottom sediments that I've uh, talked about previously. And so this is something that we've observed in Lake Erie, but it's also likely playing a major role in many other large lakes. And the figure on the right shows that for Lake Erie, the internal phosphorus loading represents about a quarter of the total phosphorus loading to the lake. So it's an important contribution to the uh, loading of phosphorus to the lake. Now, of course, Lake in Canada, Lake Erie is the poster child for the growing problem of lake reutrification. Now, algal blooms were mostly eliminated after drastic measures to reduce the external fossil load to Lake Erie, implemented in the 1970s and 1980s. And since then, the external load, uh, phosphorus loads have remained fairly stable till this day, even decreasing some more. And this led to major improvements in the lake, including the elimination of algal blooms after the 1980s. However, since the late 1990s, the lake is showing signs of reutrification with a yearly return of algal blooms. Now, interestingly, this reappearance of eutrophication symptoms coincides with the systematic warming trend shown in the um, orange uh, ellipse here on the lower panel. So one mechanism enhancing in-lake phosphorus remodelization is sediment resuspension in the shallow parts of the lake and also shoreline erosion, followed by the release to the lake water of the sediment-bound phosphorus. Now, because of the prevailing surface currents, the suspended sediment is transported alongshore in the eastward direction so that a large fraction of the associated phosphorus actually reaches the Niagara River and is transferred to Lake Ontario. Now, this intensification of in-lake phosphorus loading by sedimentary suspension and shoreline erosion is linked to climate change. First, because of the progressively earlier breakup of the ice cover in the spring, and second, because of more intense spring storms. And so together, this means that the shallow and near shore zones of the lake are exposed for longer periods to more intense spring uh, storms. And this in turn means more internal phosphorus loading. Now, the influence of, um, uh, so this is this in increased internal phosphorus loading. Now, the influence of climatic conditions on shorter time scales is also evident when we use machine learning methods to analyze remote sensing time series data. And this work in, that I'm showing here shows that the main predictors of algal bloom, uh, bio, of algal biomass, in fact, include climate variables such as the lake's surface temperature but also the watershed surface temperature, as well as ice cover duration and maximum uh, ice extent. Now, another a priori unexpected finding is that lake salinization causes eutrophication-like symptoms, in particular oxygen depletion or hypoxia in the lower parts of the lake. So in this case, the uh, eutrophication symptoms are not driven by external phosphorus loads. Now, sorry. And we show this for this uh, lake here in the Greater Toronto area, where water where, whose watershed underwent rapid urbanization after the late 1990s. And this was accompanied by a continuous increase in the application of road salt and consequently led to the salinization of the lake. As you can see on the lower panel on the right, between 1996 and 2018, the chloride concentration in the lake more than tripled. So here you see the corresponding dissolved oxygen le levels in the lake. And I draw your attention to the post-2006 data that show that the lower part of the lake is now experiencing periods of low oxygen that often last the whole year. Well, previously, this happened only in the summer. And this change in the dissolved oxygen dynamics of the lake is due to reduced vertical mixing, or if you want, stronger stratification, as the lake water is becoming denser due to salinization. But it's not related to enhanced uh, phosphorus inputs. Now, the final outcomes are related to the source and export of phosphorus from urban landscapes. And in one study, we showed that the chemical forms of phosphorus exported from urban areas differ from those of rural areas by a much larger contribution of bioavailable phosphorus associated with suspended matter. And this has implications for nutrient pro monitoring programs that are typically based on the assumption that the bioavailable fraction of total phosphorus is largely under dissolved forms. Now, the good news is that some more infrastructure, in particular sediment retention ponds, when properly managed, can very efficiently reduce phosphorus export from urban landscapes. So to conclude, uh, I would 
propose that over the course of the Global Water Futures Program, we've made significant advances in our understanding of eutrophication of freshwater ecosystems. Our findings also have some fairly direct implications of how we manage eutrophication, from considering, for instance, coastline protection in the Great Lakes, to reducing uh, the use of road salt, to optimizing stormwater management in our cities. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Philippe. We will uh, quickly go through a set of slides. So the next speaker uh, for today is um, Philippe Loring from the University of Guelph, who will talk to us about prairie wetland drainage. OK, nice to see you all. My name is Phil Loring. As Nandita said, I'm here from the University of Guelph uh, in Dish with One Spoon territory, which is the uh, traditional lands of the Mississauga of the Credit. Um, happy to be back here, though. As many of you know, I lived here uh, and worked with you all for about five years. I have been thinking about one of the big pieces of learning that we have from um, the work we've been doing, understanding wetlands and conflict over wetlands and agricultural um, drainage. And the, the words that keep coming back to me as I try to think about summing all this up is a, are the words deconstruction and construction or reconstruction. Uh, and so I'm going to tell you a little bit what I mean by that with a couple of um, examples. And so I'll start uh, in the interest of time. Uh, this is a wetland, right? Looks like a wetland. Um, this is in Passamaquoddy and Penobscot territory in what we now call Down East Maine, the cherry field uh, where my family have a home. It's about 26 acres. Uh, we take a kayak out on there. You can see this lovely, beautiful beaver, beaver dam um, that, was, that the beavers constructed that, um, that obstructed some water flow and, and have filled up this area. It's an interesting wetland because a lot of folks don't like it. Uh, in the last 20 years or so, um, folk have gone in there in the middle of the night with some dynamite and blown up these beavers' dams, but the beavers keep coming back and they keep rebuilding it. And as you can see, um, it persists um, to, much, to, their consta to their great consternation. And so that's a wetland, as we all generally, I think, understand it. As those of you know, um, who, who maybe have um, read about this in my book, Finding Our Niche, um, another really interesting wetland that I've had the opportunity to spend some time in over the last few years is La Hacienda de Santa Clara, which is uh, in Cucapa territory, which now we call Sonora, Mexico. Um, and this is a really interesting example because this is a part of the Colorado River Delta that for decades was completely dry. Uh, nothing there but sand and, and that had changed tremendously with the damming of the Colorado River. Uh, but in the 90s, um, in the interest of moving salinated water to try to stay up with water treaty in, uh, between U.S. and Mexico, they built it, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers built a trench uh, to, move, to move agricultural wastewater um, and ostensibly bring it to the Sea of Cortez. But they got as far as they could, looked around, didn't see anybody, and they stopped and they let the water flow and let the water flow and look what happens. The wetlands come back. Uh, reconnected water with the Sierra Cortez for the first time. Uh, this is very contested, whether or not this is natural. Is it a wetland? Is it real? Because now that water is uh, in such high demand in Arizona, they're thinking about turning, turning this water off and desalinating it. So a wetland, was it built? Is it natural? And then we go back to where I um, presently live um, in what we now call Guelph, again, dished with one territory, and this is a stormwater wetlands uh, behind our house. It was constructed in the 90s when the development was built to manage stormwater runoff. Uh, it's a place that uh, I take walks every morning with my dog, and it's a place where in the spring and summer and fall and winter I walk with my daughter and we talk about ecology and systems and biodiversity. Um, but this is a wetland, and this is how she's experiencing in her life a wetland. And then back to the research here. Somewhere, I think we were in, on the road, Helen and I were um, doing, I think we were driving down to Quill Lakes when we were doing some of the um, early research on conflict over prairie drainage governance. Um, you know, here you see another wetland uh, that some people may not call a wetland. Some might want to call it a slough. Uh, some might want to call it wasteland, and many of you know that was part of the title of a film that I co-produced with Don Selby, who's here somewhere. Uh, and so a wetland, a wasteland, all of this, all of these different experiences have had me thinking, what are they? And what they are very much has become a question of how people define them. And different people will look at this picture 
and draw lines around some of these um, features and call them wetlands perhaps, but not others. And uh, you may very well not get the same answer. And so I've been thinking, what does that mean about this concept? What does that mean about how we people are constructing in their minds wetlands, why we're simultaneously trying to work against the physical, very physical act of deconstructing wetlands on the landscape? And you can see lots of talk about that deconstruction when people quote numbers like 50 to 70% of wetlands being lost in a period of time. So there's a, there's a process that we're engaging in and how we're constructing them in one sense while, they're also trying, while we're also trying to deconstruct them or stop deconstructing them in another sense. And the, the challenge here of this definition isn't necessarily you know, the end point where we have to throw up our hands because you could say the same thing of what is a beard in a sense, right? Well, that's a beard um, for sure. That's a beard. I have had a beard like that before. And that's definitely a beard, right? Uh, maybe there's a beard there, I, you know, it came up when I Google searched for images of beards. Uh, but then maybe that's not a beard, it's a mustache, that's not the part down here. And so the point here is we have this construction of beards, and we have this idea that's different for many people. It doesn't mean the phenomenon of the beard is invalid in some way, but it does, maybe this is a little bit of a trite ex example, um, but, but a, a nice sort of metaphor for bringing focus from back to this idea of how we construct wetlands. And we do that in really, you know, in varying ways, depending on who we are, how we talk about what wetlands are, what, what it means to have water on the land, wet land. Um, our values, our culture go into that. Our relationships with those places go into that. How do we think about them? Do we think about them as habitat for something other than ourselves? Do we think about it as home? Um, do we think about it as refugia, a place where, where um, the rest of our non-human neighbors have to go to get away from our negative impacts? Do you call it the bush? As I said, is it wasteland? Is it a slough? Uh, if you're thinking about draining it. So we're very, depending on who you are and where you're working and what your values are and what your livelihood is about and what you worry about at night, you construct wetlands in a different way. As I said, meanwhile, we're deconstructing wetlands in a very physical way, in very material ways with drainage, agriculture, you know, drainage for agriculture, development for cities, development for the community that I live in that has a wonderful wetland that I experience with my daughter and my dog and my spouse every day or um, go on walks through, teach my daughter about science. That artificial, if, perhaps if you want to use that word, wetland exists where there almost certainly was a wetland before. So that was deconstructed to reconstruct a wetland. And so now we're faced with this challenge. We want to do better. I think a lot of us in this room are here because we want to do better, solve the wetland problem, stop failing wetlands, start conserving wetlands. And so what we're engaging in to some extent is now we're reconstructing wetlands that have been deconstructed in material ways. We're using restoration. We're building new wetlands. We're putting new wetland-like features on the land. We're creating them where we think uh, they fit in the landscape, where they help us, where they help habitat, right? And then this weird thing is also happening is that while we're trying to conserve wetlands, we're also still deconstructing them. We're just now deconstructing them in conceptual ways. We're deconstructing them by creating typologies of what is and what isn't a wetland. We break them down into class one, class two, class four, class five or we break them down into the services that they provide. It's carbon sequestration, it's water storage capacity, it's flood risk reduction. In that way now, even in our quest to, con to reconstruct and conserve wetlands, we find ourselves deconstructing them in conceptual ways, while we construct them in conceptual ways around the things that they provide to us, or the points as points on a global map. When I look at this map, you know, it's not a map of, map of wetlands, right? This is, a, I think, the Ramsar data of, of wetland of wetlands around the world, and it's a, it's a map that tries to construe what wetlands are on a global scale, and it reminds me of the Rene Magritte painting. Uh, this is not a pipe, right? These are not wetlands, they're triangles, right? Um, but we reconstruct them when we think about them at a particular level or scale in a different, in a particular way. All of this is to say that wetlands are troublesome. They don't fit our human understanding of a world and our relationship in it, or at least not our Western understanding of the world and our relationship in it. They're troublesome because they're dynamic. They change from year to year. Is it a wetland or isn't it? Well, it depends. How much water is there? Uh, they're intimately and extensively connected to each other. 
And they're also often unavailable to our settler development imperatives. Uh, and we can't control them, right? We cannot control wetlands um, without erasing the fundamentals of what they are, so they're troublesome. I'll just end real quickly here, because I see I'm out of time with, with ending on what do we do about that? Well, I think what we do about that is stop trying to deconstruct them, and especially stop trying to deconstruct them in, as a way to reconstruct them by putting them back into concept, into context, excuse me, uh, by, by understanding that this trade-off that we've created between our food systems and our wetlands is itself a construction of what wetlands are and what food systems are. And so in the, in the attempt to try to figure out how to make our food systems better, if, it's a, if food systems and wetlands can't coexist, then perhaps that's a failing of the way we've constructed what food systems are, not what wetlands are. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Phil. So we will move from that to uh, Helen Walsh talking to us about algal blooms. All right, thanks uh, very much for the opportunity to be here. And talking after Phil reminds me of teaching with Phil for many years. Uh, he's a tough act to follow. Um, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about bloom risks. So bloom risks really follows uh, what Philippe was talking about in terms of eutrophication. They are a consequence of eutrophication. Um, and I'll talk about mitigation, adaptation, and the path ahead. Um, and this slide is just to remind me to say um, there's a huge number of people working on this, a large number with informed bloom, um, many HQP contributing to the work here. Um, but it's a vast area of work. Uh, and, and it's uh, an important area of work. Um, I heard a few people refer to grand challenges today. Um, I'm glad grand challenges are, are still in vogue. Um, the grand challenge really is working to try to solve blooms and prevent them. Um, but in the meantime, we really see we need to adapt, and we need to adapt our drinking water systems um, and our behaviors to deal with bloom risks. Now, if you don't think about these every day, like me, and if you live in the prairies, you might, because they hit the news an awful lot, and they're hitting the news really early this year. But we care about blooms because of health impacts. Um, they can have toxins associated with them, uh, with very serious impacts on human and animal health. Um, they can impose very large costs to help remediate and also to help adapt to. Um, and it, you see in the two uh, news stories on the bottom, they can impact ecosystems we care deeply about. Those are two lakes uh, that were bloom impacted last year that are considered sacred sites, um, and certainly among many of the bloom impacted lakes uh, we see nationally. Now, we know that our capacity to monitor lakes is inadequate. We've got more than a million lakes in Canada and many um, bloom impacted lakes, particularly in the south. So monitoring is uneven nationally, as are our efforts to warn people about bloom risk. Um, and certainly, we also see relatively low compliance in some areas when we do warn people about bloom risk. Some good news is that, um, and you'll hear this theme across many areas of global water future, technology is advancing really rapidly, and that does help us address risk. Um, we see remote sensing methods really improving, really improving for prairie lakes, where um, hopefully, before too long, we'll be able to uh, have near real-time estimates um, with pretty low er error across prairie lakes. We also see genomics and toxin analyses advancing incredibly quickly, so we can understand just which of the uh, dozens of algal species present are causing problems in terms of toxin development, and what are the conditions that led to them inducing the genes that are causing us problems uh, and, and increasing in abundance. And then we can also use sensors, which have dropped radically in cost, to develop some short-term term tools on uh, forecasting, and longer-term tools, certainly, in um, ecosystems like, like Erie, where there's uh, very extensive data collection. So this combination of tools will help us um, develop uh, new approaches to warning. I mentioned advances in analytical chemistry, and certainly um, toxin analyses have advanced very rapidly, and with that is our understanding of the mixture of toxins present in many lakes. Um, we see you know, unregulated and largely unmonitored toxins present in important drinking water sources and also in recreational water bodies. And that's important, um, but it's also really challenging information to communicate because we don't really understand the risk 
of these mixtures of toxins present in bloom-affected lakes. We know that poor water quality in lakes is expensive. We know that from our work to remediate lakes, but we also know, and this is sort of a, a snippet of good news for you, um, that uh, work within Global Water Futures and also more broadly shows there's very strong public interest and willingness to pay for water quality improvement. So just one example of a very high use lake in BC suggests tens of millions of dollars um, of willingness to pay from the public to help remediate a lake. Um, and that's really important in the context of the news story on the right. You know, that's in one example of where we went to, not we, but uh, the community, um, geoengineering type methods to use chemical methods to deal with the internal phosphorus loading issue that Philippe mentioned um, and really lead to rapid changes in water quality. So we do have a growing number of tools av available and it seems the public um, is willing to pay. But to date, really, our efforts to mitigate blooms have had mixed success, mixed being a generous word. We haven't made a huge amount of progress in many ecosystems. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, one is uh, the role of climate, certainly in increasing bloom risk. Um, on the plot on the left, you see a very large pink blob. That was a bloom that came early and lasted a really long time after an extreme rainfall event. And on the right, um, we see a key drinking water resource in Saskatchewan, and interestingly, a period of really high runoff decreased bloom risk in that lake, but brought other water quality issues. So particularly in the prairies, I think we're um, between a rock and a hard place in terms of our water quality. As Philippe mentioned, a key piece of solving blooms is really managing phosphorus more effectively. And I'll say we've known this for 50 years, so 50 year anniversary. Um, I think we need to think about this quite differently. Um, and this is some recent work we've done that shows that we can shift a lake from pristine clear water conditions to severe blooms with the addition of 1.5 to 2 kilograms of phosphorus a, lake, or phosphorus a week. So I presented this at an agricultural meeting and someone approached me afterwards and said, you know, I spill that much phosphorus and I don't shovel it up. And I said, I know um, that's why this issue is so incredibly hard to solve. So the grand challenge is solving blooms. We have a long way to go in terms of um, changing our phosphorus management to get there and dealing with legacies in the landscape. We do have some work underway to test um, whether we can suppress cyanobacterial dominance um, based on manipulating tra trace metals, specifically see if we can suppress iron release to keep cyanobacteria down. And indeed, um, some of our work on trace metals is showing really interesting um, changes in trace metal cycling and also the importance of trace metals to bloom development. So what do we do know now? We know that blooms are extremely diverse in taxonomy, in risk, and their impact. They often have a high diversity of toxins, which creates a challenge to uh, translating the potential impacts on human health. We know that approaches to more monitoring and warning have concerning limitations, although technology is helping us advance there. Um, and certainly we do have major advances in some of the tools we need. We know we still have very limited success in mitigating blooms, and this is a growing issue. Flow management um, and climate matter. Phosphorus is a key area where we really need to strike the right balance between food production and protecting water. Um, but again, good news is high willingness to pay um, and a really what seems to be engaged public in this issue. So to close, um, we have diverse challenges associated with poor water quality and that go far beyond issues of blooms. Um, but we found that co-producing science and partnerships have really strong potential. Um, again, new tools will be very helpful. But real challenges of how do we scale across all of the bloom-affected lakes in Canada, all of the utilities needing to adapt, all of the communities needing to manage these risks. So lots of questions remaining on risk and risk communications, on solutions, and most notably that area of getting the right messages and advice to agricultural producers. So this challenge of that our capacity to get science into action and to really scale efforts, I think, is a key area um, for conversation broadly. So with that, um, I'll leave with this question of how do we help further build capacity to adapt and mitigate to bloom-related stressors and really to many of the water-related stressors in Canada. And I think this is an important thing to reflect on 
um, as we move towards uh, close of global water futures. Thank you. Thanks so much, Helen. And uh, the last speaker um, for uh, this session is Chris Pence. And he will be talking about the prairie water. Uh, thanks, Nandita. Um, on the subject of uh, sort of being a tough act to follow, I think I'm going to end up touching on a lot of similar themes as uh, Phil and Helen and from this morning. Uh, Colin, Marin, and, and Jane, uh, as I as I summarize a lot of the things that we did or continue to to work on in the the Prairie Water Project, in terms of this sort of prairie streams, I, um, we made a, a distinct decision very early on that we we're going to talk about what maybe most of us would consider uh, small watersheds or headwater streams uh, around like a hundred square kilometer scale, and there were some specific reasons for that. Um, that I won't necessarily go into, but um, we were, uh, as Colin mentioned earlier, we were, uh, the, the question was posed to us, uh, how many wetlands do we have to keep? And there's something implicit in that question that I won't get into, but the, um, we had to, we felt we needed something innovative, a, a, a new way to sort of grapple with that question. So we worked on, <coughs> excuse me, um, classifying all those sort of 100 square kilometers, kilometer watersheds in uh, across the prairie ecozone and built a uh, sort of a new transdisciplinary catchment classification based virtual modeling system with which we could sort of disentangle the different effects and what it may have on um, fluxes and, and flows through, through watersheds. And what we generally found wasn't necessarily new that there's a wealth of ecosystem services that these wetlands provide. There's flood control, uh, uh, nutrient retention, uh, groundwater recharge. Um, they're incredible sources of biodiversity. Um, oh, I'm not sure why that popped up later, but um, nutrient trend, nutrient retention. Um, but on the other side of the coin, we have to recognize that these these wetlands also present an opportunity cost to a lot of agricultural producers. And this is where a lot of the stress comes from. And if we don't recognize that it exists, we can't really start to address some of the problems that um, like, like Helen was speaking of or some of the conceptual things that, that I, I really like what, what Phil was saying. Um, so we need to consider that. And, but it's, it's what Graham would call a wicked problem. It, this isn't easy, and some of the reasons it's a wicked problem is that, and this is something that Marin touched on, is that place matters. And th this is from a poster of Juwaz over in the next room, and some of the take-home messages I'd like to convey from this slide are a couple things. The, the first is that HEG is high elevation grasslands. It's a catchment classification that tends to be off in the west, a lot in Alberta, MRV, it's the major river valleys. It's kind of smaller and scattered through the, uh, through the prairie ecozone. The thing is those patterns of how dret, uh, the, uh, the influence of drainage on the water budgets are different between these two catchment classifications. So their responses are completely different. The other thing I'd like you to sort of take home is that, that circle um, and the arrow, which um, is the percentage change in the uh, annual runoff for a three degree warming and about a 20% wetting in the pothole till, which is a lot of the Assiniboine watershed. And I'm gonna come back to why that's important uh, as well. So it's about a 20 to 30% increase in mean annual flow just because of the climate. The other thing that makes these things complicated uh, is that time matters. And this goes to some of the points that Phil was talking about is kind of like a wetland kind of depends on when, when you're looking at it. This is a, these are two aerial photos from St. Denis National Wildlife Area just east of town. In 1968, it was a drier period. There are places that some people wouldn't call wetlands. They might be farmed through, um, whatever, but in 2012, you, was, you weren't doing that in some of those depressions. Uh, it was a much wetter time. 
the ponds are bigger. Um, so how we deal with such a, as Phil was saying, sort of a, a complex or a diverse um, and varying um, phenomenon is, is, is quite a challenge. Um, and, and I'd like to convey a message that Garth Vanderkamp tried, somebody mentioned him earlier, I think Garth, um, Grant did. Um, what he thought about wetlands on the prairies and pothole, uh, pothole uh, prairie potholes. And that, the thing is, is that the function changes over space and it changes over time. So the same depression at a certain time will just be storing and another time it'll be connected and moving water or it'll be retaining nutrients or it'll be transporting nutrients. Sometimes it'll be recharging groundwater, sometimes it won't. And so the problem is, is that when you address with the, this kind of thing, Garth's point was that perhaps we ought to view this as a complex and manage it like a complex rather than individual rather than individuals. So, um, but this is, this is difficult. And uh, Colin introduced this idea of triple loop learning that was introduced, or I, I think it was uh, that, that Graham introduced it to the group. So if you think about are we doing the right things, there are a lot of great policies that we have for wetlands on the prairies in all three provinces. Um, but what Helen was saying, kind of about only having sort of mixed success in when it comes to dealing with blooms, it begs the question, are we doing things right? If we're having mixed success, then maybe we're not doing things completely right. And so that's kind of the next phase that we're, I think as a society we're, have, we're kind of dealing with. And this is where I want to come back to that sort of plus 30%, because we do have some, I'll use it again, grand challenges. And Lake Winnipeg is one of them. Um, the province of Manitoba has set nutrient targets um, a few years ago. Um, and some modeling that was done outside of GWF, maybe about 10 years ago, implies that in order to meet those targets, we have to decrease the flows by, 20, by 10%. The problem is we're butting up against climate that's probably going to increase the flows another 20%. So that means we need a 30% reduction in flows in like 2050 or 2060. And that's going to be tricky. And so in summary, I think there's a couple of things. Um, one, uh, one success I think we've had out of prairie water is that there we do now have a transdisciplinary approach to disentangle some of these uh, impacts or influences, climate, uh, wetland drainage on these, uh, uh, that apply pressures to, to the aquatic ecosystem services. Um, we have a way to figure out the, um, the, um, the influence of climate and ecosystem services, as well as the costs associated with um, uh, retaining or keeping uh, wetlands on the landscape. And I, this is a painting by Cam Forster. It's next door, called Vanishing Wetlands. And I think the bunch of us in, in Prairie Water really like this painting because it can speak to you in so many different ways. Some people like the right-hand side and say, that's the landscape I want. Some people look at the left-hand side and say, that's the landscape I want. The issue is that we're probably going to, if we're going to help Lake Winnipeg, for instance, we're probably going to have to come to some sort of rebalancing of things and um, consider the, employ you know, the importance of place and time and um, perhaps try to figure out ways to leverage the function of the entire wetland complex or large portions of the wetland complex. Um, because maybe what we're trying to do right now isn't always working. And I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you so much, um, everyone. So I have a couple slides um, to uh, talk through. Um, one of the things with, with Global Water Futures uh, that uh, in these last um, six, seven years has really spoken to me as a person is, 
is the really close engagement uh, with with real life societal questions, and and that's why this the, these ideas of uh, wetland, wetland restoration, wetland protection, and linkages between that and uh, algal blooms. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the land lake connections in this space. So the, despite this fact, the the session is changing ponds, lakes, and wetlands, but you cannot really um, take the water body apart from the land it belongs in. And um, one of the key aspects of this is thinking about management strategies that help protect us against blooms. Uh, one of them is wetland restoration. Um, so in our work, we've been looking at a lot of water quality data across the Great Lakes Basin. And one of the things we found with that is that uh, the bioavailable phosphorus ratio, so the ratio between the dissolved phosphorus and the total phosphorus, which really is one of the key drivers of algal blooms, increases with increase in the tile drain fraction. And this is parallel to work that has been seen by Helen Jarvie and others in some watersheds in the Great Lakes Basin, but this is with 200 watersheds across the basin. Now, how is this related to wetlands? Well, what do you do about tile drains? Tile drains drain the wetlands. So when you have increasing tile drains, that means you're draining those wetlands in the landscape for increasing crop productivity. And what we're seeing here is just that act is decreasing the bioavailable phosphorus fraction and potentially increasing your bloom intensities. We also found that increase in livestock density increases the bioavailable phosphorus fraction. And again, when you have a lot of livestock, you have uh, an impact in terms of water quality. One of the um, most interesting things that we found, and this is not published yet, is that uh, across the Great Lakes Basin, we are seeing a pervasive increase in dissolved phosphorus concentrations across the basins. Uh, so total phosphorus has been decreasing pretty ubiquitously across the basin, but dissolved phosphorus has been increasing. And um, the interesting thing is that the increase is actually greater at higher latitudes. So we talk, we talk a lot about agricultural systems, but in this case, we are seeing evidence of increase in dissolved phosphorus in forested watersheds in the more northern latitudes in the Great Lakes Basin. And one of the hypotheses uh, is that this is caused by increased winter warming that contributes to preferential transport of, dis of dissolved phosphorus through the landscape. Of course, when we are talking about these northern watersheds in, in the Great Lakes Basins, these are also more oligotrophic systems. So um, the lower watersheds where concentrations are um, much higher, they are also increasing, not just as rapidly. So it, if you want to manage this landscape, you have to think about both the agricultural systems and what the levers are in the agricultural systems, as well as the forested systems, where probably we might be seeing both increased blooms both from the perspective of uh, decreased lake ice, which uh, Philippe Van Kappelen was talking about, as well as uh, increased dissolved phosphorus concentrations in some of these systems. However, what about the more uh, southern watersheds in this region where you have uh, increased risk from phosphorus? And one of the things that our group focuses a lot on is thinking about legacy phosphorus and legacy nitrogen and how past legacies impact your water quality. Uh, we develop models of these legacy nutrients. And one of the key things, uh, and again, I keep bringing back this question about levers in the landscape, and one of the key things with our phosphorus work, it showed that um, one of the key aspects that can be changed is livestock nutrient management. And livestock nutrient management has tremendous role to play in how fast we improve our water quality. Of course, I don't want to forget nitrogen and groundwater nitrogen. And we don't talk about it as much in here, but groundwater nitrogen legacies are also building up, and that threatens our drinking water nitrate sources. Uh, we heard Sarah Dixon uh, today earlier talk about private wells and nitrate cons and, and E. coli in private wells. Nit Nitrate concentrations in these wells are also high. So jumping about to solutions, thinking about solutions in these landscapes, we heard uh, about uh, wetland drainage and in the, in the prairies as well as in different areas. One of the key things with wetlands that, uh, that is important to recognize is the value of these small wetlands in the landscape, the small wetlands that have water only for part of the year. And we talk a lot about connectivity. As hydrologists, we are trained to think about connected landscapes. And in this work, we kind of flipped this idea around its head and said disconnectivity matters. And this is really important in these landscapes where you have, um, where you 
uh, from a landscape perspective, you used to have these wetlands that were disconnected. And because they were disconnected, we argued that they were more efficient as nutrient filters because the nutrient came, um, entered these water bodies and was retained. Whereas now that they are connected more and more to downstream waters by tile drains, um, you see a greater impact. What we found in this work is that these smaller wetlands are actually disproportionately larger in terms of their nutrient retention abilities. And these smaller wetlands are the ones that get lost fastest from the landscape. They are the ones that are nuisance. They are the ones that are characterized as wetlands because a lot of times they don't have water throughout the year, so we don't even consider them to be wetlands. Um, so when we think about wetland loss, it is important to think about size, and it's important to think about their spatial uh, placement in the landscape. If you want to restore wetlands, if you want to protect wetlands, where in the landscape do we do that? So summarizing, uh, and this is an imperfect summary because I was not that good in getting um, the group together, but this is a little bit uh, last minute. So some of the things that we found through this process is that legacy matters, both legacy on the landscape as well as legacy in the lakes, in our reservoirs, in our wetlands, and these legacies create persistent problems. And intersecting with these legacies is a changing climate winter Warming, reduced lake ice, increased storms is increasing the probability of our blooms. Our capacity to monitor and warn about blooms is uneven, as Helen pointed out. Um, our work suggests that manure is a key part of the story. And some of the things Philippe Van Kaplan was presenting earlier, the idea that it's not just a nutrient problem, it is also a salinization problem. So. Uh, salt levels intersect very interestingly with nutrient levels to increase the probability of algal blooms. And that brings us to, in the space, of thinking about solutions to these challenges. If livestock is a problem, thinking about effective ways of livestock nutrient management, reducing salt application. There's multiple efforts of reducing salt application in our landscape, but uh, we've not talked as much about the role that might have to play to mitigate blooms building capacity for that adaptation and mitigation. And of course, wetlands hold promise for water quality improvement as well as myriad ecosystem services. But as uh, Chris was pointing out, considering locations and trade-offs is the key. As Phil was pointing out, these are these stormwater wetlands. What is a wetland is a question. And thinking about them and thinking about building societal uh, capacity and interest in protecting and restoring uh, these water bodies is key. So with that, I would like to open up for questions um, to the entire team. I know Philippe's on, um, on the Zoom too, so feel free to ask. Thank you. I'll ask a question. Uh, my name is Orly McPherson. I'm from the Calling Lakes Eco Museum. Um, there was talk early today about how uh, the waters are, are normally green, but what we're seeing now in the Calling Lakes is the when we get a bloom, it's no longer green. It's like purple, red, and it is very pungent. Um, so I know there's a lot of data or a lot of work going into studying the, the water quality. I was wondering, Helen, if you could um, answer the question, is there any testing of the air? Because it's really, I think it's impacting our health in terms, the blooms are impacting our health in terms of the air quality. Yeah, you've touched on, is this working? <laughs> Um, you've touched on an important question there. Uh, there is some science suggesting some toxins can be aerosolized and can bring risk. Um, I can sort of tell you which ones. Certainly there's one we see in Buffalo Pound Lake that is associated with um, certainly some risks. That science is very new and I would describe it as quite uncertain. Um, probably higher risk to people who work in you know, really humid areas around lakes. Um, but it's definitely an emerging area we need to think about. Oh. Sorry. There we go. <laughs> um, some of the toxins can be aerosolized. Uh, not all. 
it's an area of science that's really emerging and there's very limited monitoring in any jurisdiction on that. Um, there is one toxin that I'm thinking of in that graph that certainly can be a concern. It would be the greatest concern, for example, in the water treatment plant where you know, people are exposed to a humid environment for long periods of time. Right now, it's too soon to know um, whether it is a risk and so on. I think that science needs to advance, but um, it's, a, it's a good question and scientists are asking it, um, but I don't think we have answers just yet. Can I ask one more question? Sure. Um, so, uh, as you talked about, it, this, this one is for, for Colin, or for Phil. Um, there is a lot of conflict at the grassroots level. And um, it was mentioned that we need the right balance between food production and healthy water. Part of, part of what's happening at the grassroots level is there's a lot of finger pointing. It's cottage country. They don't have their septic tanks cleaned up. It's the city of Regina. There's all these sort of rumors. And we're very good at spreading rumors, but we're very poor at spreading truth. Where, can you help us understand where Where's the phosphate coming from? The majority of it. That's probably, that's probably not a me question. <laughs> uh, that might be a me question. Um, depends on the lake. Uh, City of Regina has reduced their inputs quite substantially, uh, but there are still substantial sewage inputs. Um, the internal phosphorus loading that Philippe spoke about is really important in those lakes, and it does suggest we're gonna have a delayed recovery if those lakes do recover. Um, there's also that magic question of what's natural in those lakes. Those lakes did bloom naturally. Um, so Peter Levitt's work can sort of tell us how much and if they're getting worse. And I think, you know, they have certainly declined. Um, hopefully some of the recent changes will help uh, in terms of the wastewater treatment upgrades, but I think certainly some questions as well about drainage impacts and phosphorus loads and so on. So I don't have a, a mass balance answer, although I know someone in the room will have, um, you know, th there is a water security agency mass balance study that'll tell you um, where, where some of the phosphorus is coming from in the landscape, um, but it's always multiple sources. Multiple sources? Yeah. Hello everyone, Corin here. I, Chris, you sort of triggered me on this when you talked about place. And as a geographer, the differentiation between space and place is the value that people ascribe to spaces. And so this is a question for all of you in terms of what we know about the values that people place on wetlands, on, <laughs> on water, and where the synergies are versus, as we've just heard about, some of the more kind of competitive conflict elements. Chris just said, whoa, <laughs> <laughs> which I echo. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about as I was preparing my talk was that so-called instrumental values for wetlands, um, no matter how we seem to try to slice them, aren't cutting it. Um, I think that, you know, the interesting thing in your question, Curran, about the relationship between space and place, for me also is mirrored in, the in, in that wetlands are in a sense, in both space and time, this emergent, Thing that we recognize but under the hood are really this massive connection of relationships and life histories between water and species and grasses and people and plants and nutrients right and to to value that assemblage right it it, it, it instantly falls apart when you go to the next year or the next wetland um, because it's we recognize them as something that i think we value Still trying to figure out how we value it and how we ought to value it. Um, I know that great, significant gains are being found in um, moving to a system of values where we acknowledge personhood in the non-human around us, like personhood for rivers 
is probably the most widely written about and discussed uh, approach to changing, instead of valuing something as a resource or a thing or a commodity, acknowledging its moral standing, um, and choosing to interact with it on that, on that level as, as peers. Um, I bring that up just, again, because the, the, the ways that we ha have learned to go about valuing aren't working. Um, uh, but we're still choosing to, right? And I think that's important to acknowledge as well. Like, you know, as you all know, I think about this with conflict, which was mentioned earlier in relationship to food and our food systems. Um, and we ch have chosen to develop a food system where the incentives situate our food production at odds with these things that we've, these places, these spaces, these systems of relationships that, we've that we call wetlands. We can also choose to create a system of incentives and values that don't create that outcome. I don't know what that is, um, but I know if we can do one, we can certainly do the other. It's just on. It just magically. Can you hear me, John? No. It's on. Wow. Okay. Um, so, usually when they let me out of the office, I'm told to just stick to the science. <laughs> it's a very explicit instruction. So. Um, I'll. Um, so what maybe I'll do is I'll, I think there's two points I'd like to make. One, I would like to disagree with, with Phil, just because let's have some drama, right? <laughs> that um, the, and, and I know people have had some success in applying um, the idea of personhood or like it to, to water bodies, rivers and whatnot. Um, my take on that is that some of these systems, um, I think they transcend to us in the sense that it, they're, not, they're not people. It, it, whatever they are, they're not, they're not people. They, again, they're bigger than, than we are. And, and so I think that's an interesting take, that, you know, providing something with personhood. It, it's it's kind of shoving something into a legal system that in, in order to achieve a goal, which, which is admirable. I, I think we need to go beyond, even beyond that. And, and the other point is, um, I don't know how to do this, but this um, constructing wetlands, deconstructing wetlands, different views, space versus place. If if we're going to, you know, reach some some of these, mitigate some of these problems, I I think there just needs to be maybe some shared respect among communities for the land that makes a place a space. And I, I think I've got that correct. Okay. Anyway, so that's just, I guess that's my two points. And just some, like, anyway, thanks. It's not really a question. It's just uh, sharing a little bit of indigenous knowledge. I see you guys struggling to answer these questions. What I say to you guys is, let's go back in time a little bit. 50 years, that's all we need to do. What happened? What were we doing back then? What were we, what were we putting on the ground back then? What were, we were, we, were we making drainage systems into the wetlands back then? Everything was healthy back then. Today, chemicals is destroying everything. That's your answer to all this. I often wonder if we took all the chemicals that we allow farmers to put on the ground and mix them in a pail, what kind of a result would we get from the reaction from all these chemicals combined in one bucket. What kind of reaction will we get? Because we've never, I don't think we've ever done that. 
Like, but after it's been on the ground and then the, our, our, our snow melt or runoff or a flood, all that stuff ends up into the wetlands. And, uh, and then it becomes in one bucket and it mixes in there. And that's where all the problems start from. I know our world is hungry, short of food, eight billion people, but being a, a, a traditional person and I care about my homeland. I'm from here. I'm not an immigrant. I truly care what's happening to my backyard. And all we're trying to figure out is, yes, how can we be more friendly to the environment and let the rich people get richer? That's all we're doing here, trying to find ways for them so they, we can ease back on them. But at the same time, the mainstream people don't know, don't have a clue what's going on. We're poisoning the world by allowing chemicals to go on everything that we eat. And my poor friend Muskrat doesn't have a voice for the duck. Nobody seems to care what happens to them because they can't treat that water. They can't treat it. We're privileged to add more chemicals to our drinking water so it's drinkable. But there's a time coming, not very far from now, that we won't be able to treat that water. And we don't have no regulations on our aquifer. In this province, we don't. What are we going to drink? We have to get, stand more firm against the rich people. They can't always get their way. We have to start looking at our own lives. Our kids, my grandchildren, I love dearly. They're not facing a good future because of how we allowed rich people to take over everything that we do in this planet. Because that's who, who's, who's running the world. They're buying out everybody. That's where the money is coming from. And there's not very many of these rich people, but they have a lot of money and they have a lot of control in, in governments, in all organizations, because we need their money in order to move on, I guess. Yeah, like, but there's a time coming that We won't be able to, we won't be relying on the money. We'll be relying on a healthy environment. Warren Lyons, my buddy, I love that guy. You guys need to listen to him. He's a very, very wise man. Yeah, look him up on, on, on um, YouTube. He tells us that the, the way we're going right now the, with, the, with how we're being so careless in how we're treating Mother Earth, 50 years from now, we're in big, 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 big trouble. I know I won't be around 50 years from now, but my grandchildren and my kids will be still around. And we, we have, today's the day. And I know we're, we're trying, all of us are, we're trying to bring awareness to what's going on. But like you said, like I know, you know, we do have a, a gift, I believe, as indigenous people. It's God-given. That's one I've never, for some reason, I don't know why. I'll be blunt, I'll be honest with you guys, honest. You guys never put God in your picture. 
He's the one that created this universe. He left us a book with instructions how to be good stewards to this land. Man put God aside. During the pandemic, not once I heard our world leaders to encourage their people to cry out to God and ask him for healing. But I know believers were praying all this time. And same thing in the Bible, it tells us. It tells us in the Bible. Repent, and I will heal your land. Repent, I will heal your land. There's a lot of things we can learn from the, from, from the Bible. He's the, he's the ultimate leader. And if we gave him that time to try and know him, I think he would give us wisdom to be better stewards in this land. I know none of us are perfect. None of us are experts. But God is. We need him on our team. And I'll never be ashamed to mention God wherever I go. Because we need him more than ever. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. On that note, I would like to conclude this session. Thank you for uh, your attendance and for the wise words. Um, we'll see you again later. Okay, if we can all just take a deep breath, please, and uh, welcome our lightning talk presenters. It's time for a little concentrated knowledge. So first, I'd like to invite Ali Reza Shavaran to come and speak. Have you ever cons have you ever wondered uh, how costly it would be to uh, monitor eutrophication for a large water of body such as Lake Ontario, which spans 19,000 square kilometers? Now consider um, the challenges of maintaining its quality, especially in the near shore areas, without having sufficient data. Harmful algal blooms in the region can significantly impact its sustainability, affecting biodiversity, health, and the economy. Even more concerning are the designated areas of concern, such as Hamilton Harbor, such as Hamilton Harbor, uh, where fre frequent monitoring is vital, but traditional methods prove prohibitively uh, expensive. It seems like an impossible task, right? Well, with the power of remote sensing, we are coming closer to making this a reality. Uh, my name is Ali Reza Shahvaran, and along with my colleagues, Professor Homa Kherolapur and Professor Philip Van Kappelen, we've been exploring this fascinating area of study. Uh, we leverage a combination of images uh, from spaceborne and airborne sources, along with in-situ data. This comprehensive mix enables us to develop reliable models for estimating chlorophyll A concentration, which is a common proxy for harmful algal blooms. Having trained and tested the chlorophyll models using in-situ matchups, we can employ remote sensing imagery to track the spatial and temporal dynamics of algal blooms in Lake Ontario. If you are interested in our work, uh, I would like to delve deeper into the methodology challenges and our outcomes I would encourage you to visit our poster next room, uh, number 67. Uh, thank you very much. So 
well done. Here we go. Ali yes. Reis, and this is Abdus Sabir. Abdus Sabir. Yes. Okay. So, so hello. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Abdus Sabur. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Waterloo and working with Professor Philip Van Capillen. So our work investigates carbon cycling of an urban stormwater management pond. And the main objective was to understand whether the pond acts as a source of carbon dioxide or sink. So do, to do so, we established carbon budget by including the loads of different carbon species going into the pond and leaving the pond with the outflow. The carbon budget also includes the carbon flux at the pond water and atmosphere interface and the burial of carbon with sedimentation from the pond's water column. So our carbon budget results shows that the pond acts as a neat sink of carbon dioxide, although it emits carbon dioxide. However, the emitted carbon dioxide is very minorly contributed by the sewer shed exported carbon, but is significantly contributed by the mineralization of organic carbon, which is produced locally through photosynthesis by the riparian vegetations. So if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, just you are welcome to visit our poster. So poster number 83. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Uh, Mayor Shafi? Yes. yes, here you go. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Mahior. I'm a research scientist at the University of Waterloo. It's a pleasure to be here talking about you know, urban phosphorus. Um, so this short talk is a compressed version of uh, poster number 85, just summarizing a part of a project that we have been doing in the past couple of years in southern Ontario. So what we did is basically we took samples uh, from stormwater sewers in three catchments in southern Ontario two of which having mixed land use and one being fully residential. Then we took samples to the lab and ran detailed phosphorus speciation analyses to obtain water chemistry and phosphorus composition in our water and sediment samples. Then we used this data and uh, employed multiple linear regression models to forecast loadings of phosphorus in these sites. So we calibrated and verify these models so that they are transferable to time windows in the past, and then we use them to simulate long-term annual loadings of different phosphorus species. So what we found was that these models were kind of performing well, especially when the uh, level of imperviousness was high in these catchments. And then our simulated loads were close to the lower bounds reported in the literature. But our work was beyond that. We just looked into speciation and extracted uh, as, inf as much information as possible. For example, we realized that the full residential catchment exported relatively higher amount of reactive phosphorus in both dissolved and particulate form. So that's a minus, but the plus is that, you know, this catchment drains into a stormwater pond and our phosphorus mass balance analyses showed that the pond is actually serving as a promising uh, phosphorus retention hotspot in this catchment. So overall, the studies like this you know, contribute to existing knowledge about phosphorus dynamics in urban catchments, and models like this can be actually used in other areas as well. Thank you so much, and have a good day. Thanks. And 
Hello, my name is Jovana, and with this I would like to invite you to take a look into our poster number 81, where we actually um, showed how we established the novel link between two huge water quality problems, salinization and eutrophication, that are usually considered separately. Eutrophication, as is already mentioned, is a huge water quality problem for many decades, and that's why street control and phosphorus are implemented. Some of the lake actually receives less phosphorus inputs, and uh, however, they still maintain in their eutrophic state. That's why we analyzed more than 20 years of water chemistry data uh, for multiple lakes in North America, and something which we found is that all those lakes uh, have increasing salinization due to excessive use of the road salt. Once when salt is applied in the watershed and reach the water body, the water column density will increase. When water density increases, that has impact on mixing regimes. When density is greater, for lake is harder to mix, and for oxygen is further harder to reach the bottom of the lake. That's why uh, we observed that uh, during the time, uh, dissolved oxygen in water bottom uh, decreased. Depletion of oxygen is favorable, favorable for phosphorus remobilization from the sediments, and that is exactly what we observed in lakes of North America. Both eutrophication symptoms, oxygen depletion, and uh, phosphorus remobilization from the sediments are usually uh, attributed to phosphorus external uh, inputs to the lake. However, in this research, we show that despite the fact that total phosphorus inputs to the lake decreased, external inputs, uh, lake uh, experience uh, amplifies eutrophication symptoms due to salinization. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanna. And now we have Stephanie Slowinski. Okay, great. Yeah, so uh, my name is Steph Slowinski, and I work at the University of Waterloo. Uh, we heard already, and we all probably already know, uh, that phosphorus is the, the major limiting nutrient for algal growth in, in freshwater lakes. Uh, and we also, probably a lot of you know, that uh, land use is a major driver of uh, phosphorus loading to lakes. Uh, but the question that we asked in this work was, uh, what happens to a lake when the land use land cover in it, the watershed surrounding the lake transitions first from uh, kind of natural forested land cover then to agricultural land cover, and then to urban land cover. So Philippe already showed these aerial images, but they show nicely how uh, our case study lake, Lake Wilcox, uh, which is located in the greater Toronto area, just north of the city of Toronto itself, how its uh, land use changed with uh, kind of intensive agriculture in the 1950s, post-World War II, and then in present day and since the, the early 1990s, uh, a rapid increase in urbanization. And so to answer the question that I, I posed, we collected a sediment core from uh, Lake Wilcox and we, we dated the sediments uh, as is usually done with sediment cores. And then we, we analyzed the sediment core also for phosphorus concentrations, uh, for indicators of uh, algal productivity, chlorophyll A, and also for indicators of kind of bottom water oxygenation, so your classic eutrophication symptoms. Uh, and the overall goal then was to reconstruct phosphorus mass balance, the phosphorus mass balance for the lake over time. And so I, I haven't shared any results here as others did in their lightning talks, but you can come to poster 82 to find out more. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Poster 82. Uh, Lewis Alcott. It's really bright. Hey, hello. Uh, so a little bit of a switch away from nutrients for a second to microplastics. Obviously, pretty nasty. Um, and I'm a postdoc at the University of Waterloo, uh, working with Philippe Van Capellen and Ferdinand Reznezad. And 
hopefully my poster and this little quick talk will convince you that I've attempted to quantify uh, the amount of microplastics coming out of wastewater treatment plants in the different watersheds of the Great Lakes. Um, and we did this using a very, very simple empirical relationship, basically just working out the total amount of microplastics uh, a general person can produce, and then the fraction of microplastics that are actually retained and then kept within the uh, wastewater treatment plant when the water is actually treated. Um, so when we actually get those flux measurements out of the wastewater treatment plants, uh, I just threw them into a really, really simple box model uh, where each box represents an entire Great Lake. So it, there's a lot of big assumptions in there, but the first order and like our best first guess in terms of actually understanding what's going on, it's not a bad first approach. Um, so when we do that, we can run the model to basically steady state in the top right hand graph there, and we can figure out the total number of individual counts of my microplastics in each of the Great Lakes. Uh, so Lake Michigan's obviously the highest one there, and it's around about 10 to the power of 22 individual counts of microplastic in Lake Michigan. Uh, but the handy thing about this model is that you can actually track where the microplastics originally come from. So in the bottom bar chart, you have Lake Ontario, and you can see that the majority of microplastics in Lake Ontario aren't actually derived from the watershed of Lake Ontario. They're actually mainly from all the way back in Lake Michigan and the US side of Lake Erie. Um, so I have these kind of bar charts for all the different Great Lakes, and hopefully if you've got any cool, cool questions, please come find me at poster 89. Thank you, Lewis. Now, last but not least, we have Yichun Huang. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Yichun Huang. I'm a postdoc from the Department of Economics at the University of Waterloo. Uh, as, uh, as early as in 1972, Canada and the US signed the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. It committed that two countries to restore and enhance water quality in the Great Lakes ecosystem. Since 2010, the US has been spending uh, hundreds of million dollars per year. The US government has also authorized over $400 million for fiscal year 2024. Meanwhile, Canada has committed um, $33 million to clean up efforts between 2017 and 2022. Recently, the Canada government announced a commitment of over 400 million Canadian dollars over the next decade on the Great Lakes. Given this background, uh, some, uh, some questions of interest have arisen. Mm, the first one is, does the public have the same concern about the Great Lakes as governments? The second one is, um, how should governments spend public taxpayers' money? How to distribute them across different lakes? And the third one is, did the public change their mind during the pandemic? In order to answer all those questions, we conducted two rounds of survey in 2019 and 2020, respectively. It turns out that many people have misperception about the quality of the lakes in that they were over optimistic, which shows the necessity to raise public awareness. Regarding the willingness to pay for water quality improvements, evidence shows that on average, it ranged between 71 cents and $506 per household per year for achieving various levels in different lakes. The results show significant decreases in the willingness to pay in 2020 in both countries, which suggests that the influence of the public concern about their uncertain income situation due to the first wave of the pandemic might outweigh the influence of the increasing public awareness of the essential water services provided by the Great Lakes during the first wave of the pandemic. If you are interested in further details, I invite you to stop by poster number 42 to check it out. 
Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks very much. Let's have a big round of applause for those people presenting.